evening. I'd like to welcome all of our football alums to probably the most unusual homecoming that we've uh, ever experienced. But I think this is a great opportunity for everybody to reconnect and rejoin. I'm so sorry that uh, we're not able to be all together at one of our exciting football games, but I understand that uh, tonight's preview of the 2017 Carnegie Mellon Case Western Reserve football game uh, is going to take place with a lot of, uh, I'm sure, fun and engaging commentary. That game had to be the most exciting football game I've seen in my entire life. And I remember sitting in the stands with uh, Provost Baselak at the time, and both of us were just shaking our heads. It was just the most incredible game. I know you're really going to enjoy it and have a great evening. Uh, and I, I certainly want everyone on this call to know that uh, the guys and our coaches are doing a great job of just getting it, getting after it on the field every day in practice. It's certainly not what any of us expected, but it's a great opportunity, at least for them to be together and to have a chance to improve their skill work and their skills. We don't know what to expect uh, in the future, certainly in the spring, but we hope to be able to provide some opportunities for our student athletes to, uh, to get some competition, but we just have to wait and see. In the meantime, I wish you all well. I wish you an enjoyable evening, and I know you'll certainly have a lot of fun and laughs uh, looking at the glory days on the 2017 Carnegie Mellon Case Western game. So enjoy the evening. Good evening. Welcome to all family, friends, alumni, and supporters of the Case Western Reserve University football team. While we regret that we can't all join together and watch the Spartans take the field this year for the annual homecoming game, we're excited to bring you a unique, never-before-seen look at the Case Western Reserve football team, and with it, a review of one of the biggest moments and wins in program history. My name is Andrew Rossman, class of 2017. I'm joined by my co-host, Steve Bocci, who we'll get to meet shortly, and I'll be your host for tonight's replay. With me, I have a number of former players and coaches that will join me in rewatching the classic 2017 Academic Bowl between the Case Western Reserve University Spartans and then a Car Carnegie Mellon Tartans. Joining us tonight, as I said, are Steve Bocci. We also have Justin Fan, wide receiver, Ian Henderson, defensive tackle, Justin McMahon, linebacker, Andrew Banathy, linebacker, Zach Lyon, linebacker, Jacob Burke, running back, Patrick Crossy, safety, and Luke Bedell, cornerback. We're also lucky enough to have members of the coaching staff with us, head coach Greg Debelak. Also joining are Ben Lolly, Derek Slesh, and Warren Miller. Throughout the night, we're going to get the chance to hear from each player and coach to see what they were thinking, how they were reacting, and how they felt throughout one of the greatest games in program history. Just to set the scene for everybody, coming into the game, the Case Western Reserve Spartans were 9-0, had not really been challenged all year, and knew that this rivalry game here at the end was going to bring a pretty good test as they, they worked to achieve a playoff berth for the first time in a couple of years. They're facing off against the Carnegie Mellon Tartans. The Tartans were 7-2 and two coming in. Strong football team, had strong senior leadership at a number of key positions, and as we'll see throughout the night, definitely offered a, a strong hurdle and a strong test for the Spartans. So at this point, I'll give uh, Steve Bocci a chance to introduce himself and you know continue to set the stage for this game that we have tonight. How's everyone doing tonight? My name is Steve Bocci, uh, class of 2019. Uh, I played right tackle in this game. I'm very excited to be here to be able to announce this game with my co-host, Andrew Rossman, and as well to see many former of my friends and teammates relive this great special moment in our uh, history together as Spartans. So without further ado, let's jump right into it. Spartans versus Tartans, playoff berth on the line for the Spartans, November 11th, 2017. Here we go. Opening kickoff here. Coach Debs, do you want to take us through just kind of your initial emotions going into this game, whether you approached it any differently, you know, knowing all that was on the line for, for us as we went into this final week? Well, I think we were pretty confident, um, but knew after your introduction was perfect. Mellon was a really good team. Um, earlier in the season, they had beaten Thomas Moore by 20. And Thomas Moore is pretty darn good um, team. Um, they had their all-time leading passer, their all-time leading rusher, and their all-time leading receiver on offense. They were really formidable. And defensively, they were strong. Like I said, they, they beat Thomas Moore by 20. They lost to W&J by seven. It was kind of a controversial ending where they had a chance to tie it, and the, and the refs made a controversial call. So knew we had our hands full, but – we were playing really good too. We had just beaten a really good Westminster team uh, by 35 the week before. So we were, we were confident. And um, I think coaches on both sides of the ball and special teams thought we had a good game plan, but knew that Carnegie Mellon would too. 
Um, I was probably going to get down to who made the least amount of turnovers and who made the, the most amount of big plays. So we'll start the offense. And preface the first series as you look at it, it's, it's seven dives, two passes, and Bocce and Peterson jumping off sides. <laughs> Bachi, do you want to hop in? Early, we're going to see some, yeah. some pretty good movement from the offensive line. And, you know, what does it mean when the offensive line is able to get that movement so early in the game? And, and how does that kind of set you up for the rest of the game as we go? Well, it feels really good to get out there and start with a couple of run plays. I know we were, had some great quarterback play, great receivers among us, but every offensive lineman will tell you they love to go out there and run the ball right down the opponent, right down the middle of the opponent's defense. As you can see here, we're running a series of dive plays, except for this nice little – screen pass um but it feels really good when they come out three and two and think they can stop the run and you just go man on man and you just run the ball right down their throats it's real nice also to have a big back like jacob burke back there see here not touch for seven yards um but obviously carrying two guys to bring him down yeah and we'll, uh, we'll jake how does it feel like when you hit a hole Yeah, I mean, the line did a great job, especially running all these dive plays. Um, like Bocce was saying, it feels good just to run straight down their throats, and that's also my favorite uh, my favorite angle to run as well. So, I mean, these, these first plays, it looks like we're getting six, seven, eight yards of carry, and, I mean, I think that's a great way to set the tempo for the rest of the game. Absolutely. Coach Slush, maybe if you could talk us through just, I guess, overall thoughts on Carnegie Mellon's defense, how they set up, and – you know, does this have an impact on our offense? Do we have to change what we did all year? Is there anything, you know, specific that you adjusted for going up against the Tartans? You know what? They've done pretty much the same thing against us for as many years as I can remember. And if they're going to play us even numbers in the box, which in this case is five on five, then we're going to take advantage of our, our offensive linemen going man up and a back that can uh, get north-south. And Burke did a hell of a job with that. And, you know, from a game plan standpoint, this wasn't the most complicated scheme that we had going into a game. But if you go ahead and execute it, then it, it works pretty pretty well. Yeah, can, we can see early, early on offense is moving downhill, very, very heavy on the run. And, you know, any passing game was more of the quick game variety. But – as, as Steve and everyone have touched on, it's it's important to get out quick. Uh, Carnegie Mellon's an opponent we obviously play every year in the academic bowl, so both coaching staffs highly familiar with each other, and and even the players pretty familiar with each other. And also on our roster, we have you know traditionally a good amount of Western Pennsylvania kids. So if you think pulling from that Pittsburgh area, I'm sure Zach Lyon, Patrick Crossy can touch on it at some point. But a couple guys you may have seen in high school played against in high school just kind of adds another layer to the rivalry game, makes it you know even deeper. We're moving along here. Rob, if you could touch on how important is it for you to get in a rhythm early and, you know, how good does it feel to have the run game at least be productive from the onset and, you know, perhaps take some of the pressure off you from from a throwing perspective? Starting off with a couple passes was always helpful and always easy when Burke runs. The second they got to bring an extra guy down into the box, uh, it just opens up so many opportunities in the backfield or the uh, secondary. So. It was, I mean, the more we had Burke running, the easier it got for me. So I always liked it. <laughs> okay, we're going to set up for a field goal here. Ben Carniel, senior kicker. End up being just short and just to the right. So not a true sudden change, but, you know, offense able to crank some time off the clock and obviously had good movement. I, I would think that the coaches are pretty happy with you know, what they saw, and at least from a schematic standpoint, not exactly happy that the team wasn't able to come away with points. But now we're going to flip over to the defense. And, and Coach Miller, overall thoughts coming into this game, what does Carnegie Mellon, you know, present from a schematic perspective then? Also, some of the senior leaders that they had. I know at running back, wide receiver, they're fairly experienced and fairly successful. Yeah, I, I think you touched on it there with just, just the overall talent uh, personnel-wise that they had on offense, you know, um, their uh, running back was was a two thousand yard rusher. They had a thousand yard receiver, a very good quarterback. Um, so it definitely presents some challenges because you know if, if you if you strengthen up to to stop the run, um, they're they're going to try to take advantage of you throwing the game, throwing the ball. 
So it's, um, you know, it's just something that you have to, you have to balance out and really do a great job game planning and, and making the kids aware of, you know, formations and when guys are lined up in certain spots and um, cause you just can't focus on one, one particular thing. Cause they, they did a lot of things well. And then, you know, constant motion all the time with formations, multiple tight ends. They, they just, they do a real nice job with those things. So our, our guys were aware of that. And, and I think you'll see as we watch um, um, some guys made some, some real good, big time plays. And um, I think it was an attribute to the way that they prepared all week. Absolutely. All right, let's take a look here and see how the Spartans start off on defense. Right out of the bat, taking a deep shot. And as we touched on, Carnegie Mellon had a, a pretty experienced quarterback, Alex Klein. They also had a receiver. His name was John Prather. And, you know, multiple years, I think you guys can attest, he was you know, a big problem for opponents. He's able to really get out and run, run the full route tree. And, you know, that combined with Sam Banger and Alex Klein on that offense made them, made them pretty formidable, pretty experienced. They know what they're doing. This is, again, a situation where they've, as much as Case Western's able to predict what Mellon's going to do, also on the flip side, Mellon has faced our defense for three, four years in a row, depending on the kid. And, you know, they know what to, know what to expect from our coaches and players. So, Andrew, that, that first play was not their starting quarterback. Was it really? <laughs> yeah, they put in a senior, you know, because it was senior day. Yep. And he, he threw the first ball, and then then they put their starter back in. No, I like it. I like it. Coming out shooting, and, yeah, it's – I mean, that's a program thing. Make sure you get the senior in there to, to play in a big rivalry game. And, you know, all credit to the Carnegie Mellon coaches. They didn't put him in there to hand it off for a two-yard dive. They they let it rip. So, you know, I'm, I'm not going to say I'm all broken up or upset they didn't complete it, but – it's a good start. We'll take it. So Zach Lyon, maybe you could touch on, and Coach Miller already brought it up a little, but what are some of the challenges that are presented with, you know, the constant motion, the constant shifting? We'll see it there. Their tight end, Carl Coombe, is pretty much 90% of the play is going to be in motion. What challenges does that bring from an alignment or defensive perspective? Yeah, I think just keeping us on our toes. Some calls were specific to where some guys on the offense were lined up. And if you change that at the last minute, that changes kind of, how our coverage works and, um, and who's going on the blitz if you're a linebacker. So it, it definitely didn't make things easy, but um, like Coach Miller said, we game plan for it all week. And so we were prepared um, to make the best out of, out of it. But yeah, they made it tough for sure. Mm -hmm. We see here Carnegie Mellon having, I guess, similar success to, to what we saw on offense from the Spartan side. So driving down the field, able to rip off a couple – couple runs and at least they're they're getting positive yardage on each play no real negative plays yet to this point and you know I think we can all agree that rivalry games everyone wants to treat it as just another game but you know from warm-ups getting off the bus you know pretty much everything from that day doesn't necessarily feel the same you can get the juices flowing and rivalry games you'll see a lot at the beginning might be a little skittish people are still settling into it with the emotions being so high so you know not necessarily uncommon to to see a unique game to start off, obviously both teams being able to, to move the ball early on. Justin McMahon, we have Justin McMahon, our at the time senior linebacker, one of the leaders of the defense. What was your perspective on Carnegie Mellon? What did, you, what did you see coming into the week? And at least initially, what was Mellon bringing to the table on game day? Well, yeah, they were a really good team. Um, and I knew just from the year before, like we had a really bad taste in our mouth. Uh, from how we finished the year prior and so we really wanted to um, I mean, we really came into that week focused and ready to go um, we knew that they were a really balanced offense especially at their running back position with uh, Sam Banger um, he was probably the best running back we faced um, among any teams we played that whole year and so um, it was a challenge just making sure we could stop him and um, turn them uh, force them to throw the ball down the field um, really make them one-dimensional so that was um yeah, a really big challenge throughout the week. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. We also have with us, as I mentioned earlier, Coach Ben Lally, uh, defensive backs coach. So, Coach Lally, I guess from your perspective, what did you see with Carnegie Mellon? How did you feel about our guys coming in? You know, we were fortunate, at least at the beginning of the game, to be relatively healthy and, you know, pretty confident about some of the athletes that we were bringing from the back end. We knew Carnegie Mellon, Prather, and, and was dangerous, and he tore us up the year before. And we knew if we could limit him, um, we wanted to make someone else beat us. And we see Carnegie Mellon able to convert the kick there, go up three nothing. So 
Case unable to take advantage of the, you know, the solid drive to start off. Mellon able to flip the field completely and end up getting on the board with three points. So, Coach Debs, at, at this point, you know, the rivalry game, I guess, has settled in. Do you come into this with a different approach coaching-wise? And then, you know, even more so when you layer on the fact that we're playing for a playoff berth here. We know it's, you know, we're not holding anything back. We're not really hiding anything. I guess overall feelings and sentiments coming into this this week 11 matchup. I guess I just try to make sure guys weren't tight. I, I think in 2016, I thought we played a little tight um, and, and Mellon, you know, played loose because, you know, they, they didn't have all that on the line that we did. And it was a similar situation. So I, I just wanted to kind of make sure everybody was relaxed and just had the belief that, Hey, we're, we're healthy. We're obviously a good football team. Um, and just go out and have fun and enjoy what, what would be a great game um, and just don't play tight. And if, you know, just let things happen. And Steve Bocci, I'll, I'll kick it back over to you. Um, you know, the offensive line on any team is at least offensively, a lot of times is going to be the heartbeat. You guys are such a, a tight knit unit, especially in this case, when you had a couple of seniors, highly experienced guys, everyone kind of knows who they can rely on and, and how the unit is going to function. So for a game like this, how did you guys feel, you know, moving through it and, you know, in the week leading up to it, how did you guys feel based on preparation and scouting and everything? Well, this offense line, especially this unit, the interior unit had a lot of experience coming into this game. I believe the three interior guys probably at that point had over a hundred career starts under their belt combined. And we pretty much, we, we tried to play pretty flat line. We didn't get too high on certain things, didn't get too low. I was probably the outlier in that group, but uh, we uh, no special preparation. We knew what we had to do. Uh, they had some. We knew they were good up front. Their linebackers didn't like us or me, maybe in particular. <laughs> but uh, we had to go out and just go after. It was just another game for us, honestly. But saying that, it wasn't because, especially for me, I had never beaten Mellon. Uh, the junior class hadn't. This actually ended up being our only time we did beat Mellon, so it meant a little bit more to us to get that win especially on their field. Steve, don't lump everybody in with you. They didn't like you, period. <laughs> and like Debo and Pig and Gage. Who couldn't like Gage? Well, yeah, Pig would make friends with the guy at the end of the game. And Absolutely. By the end of the game, he was calling me every name in the book. So <laughs> It's supposed to be another game. That's the cliche. That's what the coach is trying to instill you. It's just another game. We need to go out and execute. But I – maybe I'll just speak for myself. It didn't feel like another game. There's a, an energy, you know, leading up to it. We know what's on the line. We know that if we win, we're in the playoffs. And if we win, if we're probably 95% chance that we're not going to make it. So you can feel the pressure and, you know, some guys are able to thrive on that and keep themselves going and that fuels them and other guys kind of curl up and, you know, Justin fan unable to come down with that catch, but Justin, obviously not, you know, the most, you know, largest physically, uh, you know, measurable wise, but I can't think of someone that was tougher to cover on a day-to-day -day basis. So how were you able to use your speed and agility to, you know, maybe make up for some, some lack of height when you're going against these taller guys and how are you able to be so productive on a, you know, a game to game basis? Yeah, you're right. I'm not the biggest or uh, tallest guy. Um, so it really comes down to good coaching uh, throughout the years, throughout high school and throughout, uh, throughout college. We had really good, college wide receiver coaches. Um, and they helped me just, you know, recognize my strengths and use that's my advantage against other players that don't have those. Yeah, and this will, I can confidently say this is not the last time that we're going to jump over to you, Justin. So definitely <laughs> able to, to come up and have a big game. Coach Lally, is there anything from a special teams perspective that we saw from Mellon? I know we'll see when we get out, when we get the punt return unit out there, we had Mario kind of running back and forth, but I don't think there's necessarily anything Huge from a schematic standpoint on the special teams. Obviously, there's one, you know, monumental play at the end, but anything else specific that you needed to, to kind of game plan for? Uh, their return game is always dangerous. They, they always seem to have great returners, and they execute really, really well. And if you're not on your A game, they'll hurt you special teams-wise, with especially with the return game. So we see here from the back, I, I think the back view is really helpful to be able to obviously see both line plays. We see in the middle there, number 74, we have Ian Henderson, you know, another one of the, the leaders on the defense, not necessarily a senior, but someone that, you know, on the field definitely set the tone more times than not. So Ian, coming into this game, you know, what were your thoughts? How'd you feel about some of the matchups? And, you know, you're definitely going to flash here on a couple plays where you 
basically just throw the guy out of the way and able to get Banger down on the ground. Um, well, coming into this game, we were a little, uh, little. I'll, I'll say angst. We had a lot of angst. Um, we were healthy for the most part, uh, but a couple of us are battling injuries. I had torn my labrum in uh, game seven previously against Geneva, so uh, was a little um, skittish on some of the some of the harder practices. So we were just trying to preserve ourselves and our bodies for the game. I know, I believe Cam also suffered a high ankle sprain in a, in a previous game. So um, it was a little rough uh, remembering, you know, Coach Miller explained to us previously that they had a very, very strong O line, and obviously they had the best rusher, I believe, in all of D three. So we just wanted to um, play to our strengths and just make, just make plays when available to us, and not, uh, not make too many big mistakes. Yeah, and I think one theme that we had with with the defense is you'll see that, you know, it was all eleven guys. I don't, I don't think we had one weak spot or one, you know, super strong spot. I think everybody was really, really good at their job, and I think that trickles down from from what coach Miller tried to instill in us from, you know, from the first day of training camp all the way through this, you know, last week of the season, you'll see, especially D line linebackers. It's, it's a whole mix of guys. Everyone was kind of a unique skill set. I don't think we had two bodies or two sets of skills that were unique, you know, between any one guy and coach Miller, what, what do you think that brings to the table when an offense has to deal with the defense like we had where, you know, we're coming at them with the three, four defense and it's across the board. There's no one linebacker you can necessarily attack, not one D lineman you can really go after. Um, yeah, I, I think it, I think it presents some challenges for sure. I mean, obviously when, you know, either side of the ball, when you look to the game plan, the first thing you look at is, is what's their personnel like. And I, and I, and I'd like to think if you, as you looked across the board at us, you, you, you didn't see a whole lot of weaknesses. Um, but like you said, you saw guys with different, different skill sets. Um, you know, the two, the two inside backers had very different skill sets from each other. Um, you know, but those, those things play off of each other very well too. And um, you know, you, you've got a, a, a nose man that's as big as, as Ian. And then you have a defensive end that's 215 pounds in, in Techman. So they, you know, who's, who's more of a, you know, a speed rusher type guy. And, and, and like we said, Ian's more of a kind of plug up those a gaps and, and control the control, the middle of the, the middle of the offense. So I think it's, you know, it, I, I I'm sure we presented some problems for them as well. <laughs> At least I'd like to think so. We saw in the play there are two two safeties, strong safety, Cody Calhoun, free safety, Patrick Cross. You're able to combine to make the stop there. You know, not necessarily happy with the game they, that they. Patrick, we talked earlier about you know maybe some of the ties that you have to the Pittsburgh area. You know, being from Pennsylvania, Western PA region. So, you know, what does this game mean to you? Did you were you aware of Carnegie Mellon growing up? Is that you know a place you considered playing at? What are you know what are your emotions going into it? Yeah, I mean, I definitely heard of Carnegie Mellon growing up in Pittsburgh. I actually took a visit there. I was really leaning between them and Case and took a game visit there. Wasn't a big fan. Took a game visit to Case, and I loved it. So that was really the end of that. So the next four years, just had to beat them, try to beat them. <laughs> well, again, no spoilers, but I think we got, got the job done on this day. Now, Pat, did you know guys on the other team? Is there anyone that you grew up with or anyone you had played against in high school? I believe there were a couple – Defensive lineman that I played in high school, no one on the offense, but they do, they get a couple Pittsburgh kids, but they're like us. They got guys from all over. Yep. Ian, a lot of times people will just kind of see your size and your strength and assume that you're just going to take on double teams and let the other guys get after it. But, you know, what's your mentality when you are double team? Uh, I got to, I got to lean back on my, uh, my favorite coach, Coach Miller. You know, um, he'd, uh, there was no excuses, double team or not. We had to get the job done. So, um, you know, we all we all got to thrive where we can. And um, I, I did a lot of practicing, trying to practicing, splitting the double team. It was uh, that was my main focus um, in practice. We had special nose drills specifically for defeating a nose team. You know, you have a three, four. Obviously, the uh, the nose man is more prone to getting double teamed and uh, more obviously offensive linemen are, are centered around them. So the linebackers have a, a lot more free reign, but I, that doesn't coach Miller always told us, you know, that doesn't mean you can't perform. You just got to overcome. I think that's what we did. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, team wide, 
know, I think the coaches, the coaching staff from the position groups all the way up to, to coach Debs, I think one of the best things about the team is it was a consistent message, you know, on both sides of the ball and also with special teams. It's a consistent level of intensity, a consistent level of focus. And I know me personally coming into this game, I, I had no doubts that we were going to be ready, you know, and well prepared to, to take on Carnegie Mellon. As we see Carl Coombs able to get in there for Carnegie Mellon and, you know, right at the, the start of the second quarter, they're able to go up 10 nothing here. So if you think from our perspective, we're coming in 9-0, and we feel like we have the upper hand on Carnegie Mellon. We know if we're able to get through this, then we're going to go to the playoffs. And it's it's not necessarily a, you know, super common thing at, at Case Western, but it's the expectation now that we're going to be able to find a way to get into the playoffs. So, you know, they come out, hit us in the mouth. And like I touched on earlier, this is something where, the true test of a team is how do they respond to that? How are they able to answer when they're down, when the other team is, you know, clearly not scared of us and, and not going to back down. So if I could, you know, get Jacob Birkin in, in here for a little bit, Jake, you're obviously a huge part of the offense. Obviously run game has been, you know, a big part so far at, at this point in the game. What are your thoughts on, you know, being down 10, nothing. Do you think that, you know, do we need to change the game plan or anything, or is it still kind of business as normal and stick to what we, what we were planning on coming in? Yeah, I mean, I think at this point in the game, everything's still business as normal. Um, I think I think we, we knew that we could run the ball down their throats and get five, six, seven yards of carry. Um, and at this point in the game, I think we believe we still believe in the game plan and we thought that um, we should still keep pounding the rock. Coach Slash, is that something that coming into the game, did you know that we were going to be a little more run heavy or is that just kind of how the cards fell as as the game progressed? Again, we go into the, the the Mellon game or any game for that matter, and, you know, we want to have balance. But as I touched upon earlier, when, when you look at the numbers of people in the box, if it's even with the guys we have up front, the guys carrying the ball, we like running it. And we haven't even – you haven't even seen Rob carry the ball yet. And Rob was uh, not only a heck of a, a thrower, but he was equally good as a runner. You know, we felt strongly that we could run it. And we also felt strongly about spreading them out and going empty and doing this, doing the quarterback draw with uh, Rob. So you're going to see some empty. You're going to see the quarterback carrying the ball. You're going to see a variety of things that are designed to get the people that can make plays the ball. Yeah, and I think that's a, a perfect transition. Rob, could you touch on the QB run? We're going to see a ton of it here, especially in the second half. Did you, did you, I guess, like that play? Is that something you enjoyed running? Obviously, you're going to have a good time whenever you're picking up, you know, 10, 15 yards of pop. But, you know, how important is that play in, in Case's arsenal? And, you know, I think it changes year to year. But especially in this game with your skill set, how did that kind of play into the overall game plan? I think a lot of the time we just use it as it's necessary or if it's working. I mean, if – I mean, like you, if you asked if I like it, I mean, the QB draw is probably my favorite play. Um, <laughs> just because whenever we were passing the ball so much, the, the linebackers flew back and then I had two linemen in front of me and there's so much room to work with. And it made it so much harder for the linebackers to decide what to do. And um, yeah, I mean, if we had to give the ball to Burke, we would do that if it was working better for me. I mean, it didn't, I don't think it really mattered which way we were doing it because it was one of us was always doing well or both of us. Um, yeah, yeah, Ryan, yeah. Well, no, no surprise. That was my favorite play too, Rob. Quarterback draw. <laughs> I love and it. Rob's senior year, we tried to we tried to give him less carries because he was coming off of knee surgery. But as the year progressed, and definitely going to this game, the, the game plan on the run game, and we had really good backs. You know, most of the year we played a lot of two back sets. You know, with Aaron Aguilar and, and Miles and Jeff Brown, and they they did a really great job. Um, and had a role, but this game, just because of the defense we were playing, we needed to spread them out to run the ball effectively. And I, I think you saw that. Um, I, I think we had close to 300 yards. Um, Jake had like 160, Rob had 120. Um, so it was very effective, but we couldn't go that two back set uh, because just it just brought more people in the box and we were more effective when we spread them out. Yeah, I think by by the end of it, we'll see that you know, Mellon got pretty sick of the QB draws. We're pretty much going to be able to run that whenever we want and, and have our way with it. So we see here Rob's going to roll out to his right, and 
you know, make a great throw to Zach Medved, get down to the one. Um, I'm sure he would love to have been able to punch that in, but I think we'll see Burke here get a chance. And Jake, when you're down inside the five yard line, what's your mindset? Is that, you know, full confidence that you're going to be able to get those two yards and, you know, how much of a role does that offensive line play in being able to move guys off the ball and kind of reestablish the line of scrimmage? Yeah, with our offensive line, if I'm within the four-yard line, I'm getting in the end zone every single time. They did, they did a fantastic job all season just getting – just pushing the defenders off the ball. So it made it quite easy from the goal line situation to, to get across the line. Yep, and we see there Jake Burke able to punch it in. So that at least trims the lead. So previously Mellon had, Mellon had been up 10 nothing. Obviously good to get on the scoreboard. And, you know, I think coming in we knew – we had a high powered offense. It was only going to be a matter of time before we were able to, you know, really impose our will and, and get on the scoreboard. And I don't think anyone anticipated us, you know, staying shut out for very long. So coach Miller at this point, and, you know, might have to lean on your memory here a little bit. Is there anything that Mellon was doing that you hadn't anticipated that they had kind of thrown in as a wrinkle, or was it pretty much just kind of line up and use the same scheme that they had used all year? Not much surprising. We, we knew that it was, you know, we were going to get a steady diet of the tailback and, and the type of plays that we were going to get. And it really wasn't much, much different. It was just a matter of us recognizing and, and executing. And, and obviously, when you're, when you're trying to tackle a running back like they had, sometimes you can, um, you know, you can play everything right and he just makes a play. And, and I think that there's some instances of that happening. It was, it was what we expected. And, and I think, you know, um, our guys, our defensive guys, um, I, I think they'd be the first to tell you. Um, we, we have all the confidence in the world in our offense. Um, so all we talked about was, hey, we just have to get some stops. If we get some stops um, and get the ball to the offense, they're, they're going to score points. I mean, when you have, you know, receivers like Justin and a tailback like Jacob and a quarterback like Rob and that offensive line, they just need opportunities. Um, so that that was the plan was just to – you know, we knew we weren't going to be able to hold him to, you know, 10 yards rushing or, or, you know, that low output, but we needed to get stops and get the ball back to the offense. Yeah. And I think, I think you'll see that as we kind of settle in here, as everyone, you know, shakes all the anxiety out, there's, there's a couple big time players that we haven't mentioned yet that are going to flash on screen here in a second. And, you know, it's, especially in a rivalry game, big game like this, turnovers are really going to you know, set the tone. They can totally flip momentum. And as we'll see throughout the film here, we definitely have our fair share and we're going to be lucky enough to hear from the guys that are able to make those plays. There we have senior linebacker, Andrew Banathy, able to, you know, smoke out one of the screens and make a tackle in space and, you know, really set the tone. And Banathy, I think you were, you know, one of the more vocal leaders, one of the bigger emotional leaders on this defense. What did this game to mean to you in your senior year, knowing that if we win, we're in the playoffs. We, you know, we achieved at least our, our first step of goals. Um, our team was very proud of everything that we've done, but we always knew that we can make that next step. And we weren't going to let Carnegie be that one team that got in the way of that, um, which they almost did. But, you know, nonetheless, um, I mean, it was just, it was 11 guys on defense. Every single play gave their heart and soul. And no matter what, we worked as one team and, that was our objective. And usually when we set our mind to something, we got it done. And that's a credit to every single guy that I got to play with because there was times when I was down, other guys were picking me up. And that's just how we played as a team and as a unit. Yeah, absolutely. It was, you know, top to bottom, number one guy on the team, all the way down to the, you know, the youngest freshman, most inexperienced freshman. It was a, it was a team effort, you know, every day of the week. And it showed up on game days. And as I mentioned, we're gonna we're gonna see Mr. Banathy here show up and, and make some big time plays throughout the game as we as we keep moving. I just want to say about Andrew real quick. I feel like if you watch this game in some of the last few games of our year, <laughs> that, this dude was an animal on the field. Like he was flying all over the place making plays. Uh, as we'll see in a second. Well, I mean, if we're gonna throw compliments, uh, just. I mean, I think Coach Miller touched on it. Justin and I were the two polar opposites in terms of linebackers. He was cerebral, and he knew exactly what to do every single time. Um, sometimes, you know, I was a little bit lost, and I focused a little bit more on, you know, the physical play. So him and I playing complete opposites, but we played off each other so well, and 
honestly, I don't think I've ever played with a better linebacker than him. So, yeah, good one two punch in the middle right there. So, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Real quick, yeah. I just I paused it here because Justin, when I reviewed the game, uh, I, you know, I wanted to get your reaction to this play because you reacted here after the ball was incomplete. I don't think we ever matched you up with a receiver running a corner route very <laughs> So um, I, I, I was watched, just wondering what was going through your mind when you said, I got to guard this dude on a corner route. So I watched this last night. And as soon as I watched, I was like, what happened that I ended up on this dude? I was <laughs> like, <laughs> I was glad that like the quarterback overthrew him a little bit, but cause I mean, I was kind of with him, but you know, I'm not a coverage dude. I, I think yeah, Pat I, might have three to say about how you ended up by yourself. <laughs> I, know, I, I, was, I was upset with someone on this play. Yeah, my, I, I think we can nail down who the someone was. and we... <laughs> I know. If, but if, if I remember the game plan specifically in this defense, uh, number one was not supposed to be left by the safety. Yeah, my bad. I think number two following that was don't, like Mc, don't let McMahon alone with any receiver. <laughs> I think that was bolded and underlined, and that was kind of a, a season-long thing. But, but – you might be, you know, reacting that way now. I think your your coverage skills will show up here later in the game if we want to throw a little teaser out there. So defense able to go out there, get a big stop from Mellon, and, you know, that's huge after the offense is able to punch it in, get the touchdown, get back on the board. And now it's 10-7 Mellon, and, you know, that high-powered offense is coming coming back on the field. So you open it up and empty and able to air it out there a little bit. And there we have Mr. Fan laying out, making a play. Justin, do you, do you feel like their, you know, defensive backs were – Good, great, average. What, what were your thoughts on on going up against them? I know they for sure had some good size. There's a couple guys that were six two, six three that you know presented some size matchups. But as we've seen, your your speed was able to kind of mitigate that. Yeah, they were definitely good players. Um, they played a little bit weird on defense. Um, I know in the BAC, a lot of teams don't play man; they play a lot of zone. Um, so it's it's tough to beat um, on certain things. They could stop uh, a lot of certain routes if they wanted to with the zone. But, um, I mean, we game plan for it during the week, and basically what we game plan for was what they gave us, and we had things that we worked on that could beat them, and this is one of them. Yeah, Andrew, they, they play a very unique defense, um, and they're ba- and that's why we stayed four wide also. If we could formation them um, into some situations where the, this is a play where uh, Justin's being guarded by an outside backer in man coverage with help over the top, but then we had Zach Hurd being guarded by an inside backer um, up the seam. So that guy over the top had to keep his eyes on both those guys. So it, it was tough. We had two really fast kids being guarded by linebackers. And number 25 is their corner playing basically a safety position. They were playing a lot of two man. So that was our game plan. We were going to try and get those matchups and, and throw deep. And, and see if they could, could guard some of our fast receivers. And they did a good job most of the time, um, but this is one of the times where we made a play. Yeah, and I think, I think what we're getting at here on this replay in the, in the background, you see this kind of – I don't know if there's a team this wouldn't happen, but it speaks to the team culture. You see the entire defense kind of light up there. And, you know, obviously, as much as the offense can keep the ball and get our defense a rest, that's going to be crucial not only for getting points on the board, but also keeping that defense fresh. Ian likes it. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and I think one of the one of the interesting things, and it speaks to how Mellon was able to kind of take away some of the portions of our offense throughout the game. There's actually only three receivers that had a reception, so Justin's going to have a couple big time catches. Medved, we already saw his catch, and then Luke DeFrancisco is going to only have three catches as well. So. You know, Zach Hurd was able to have a great season, had a bunch of long, long touchdown runs, one of the fastest guys that I've ever, I won't say had to cover, tried to cover in practice. And, you know, they were able to take him, take him out of the game for the most part. But same thing as the defense. The, our offensive unit had, you know, a wide variety of body types, players, skills, you know, abilities, and also different levels of experience. So tough to defend. Um, you know, a lot of different angles that we're coming at you with. And, I think one of the tougher things that Mellon has to deal with is we've already seen the, you know, strong, strong power run game, whether it be from Robert and the QB draws or Burke up the middle, but, you know, leaning on that offensive line, we were also able to, to mix in kind of a spread 
the spread passing attack. And it just makes it extremely difficult for the defense to, to try and game plan for not only different styles, but different players bringing those styles. Yeah. Uh, I don't know, maybe not in this game in particular, but I know over the course of the season at many times, it felt like our offense could go out there and we could win any way we wanted to, whether we wanted to go out and rush for a couple hundred yards or just throw seven touchdowns. I, we as an offense felt when we took the field, we can beat this team no matter what the game plan is. And if we go in and the game plan's not working, credit to Coach Slush and Coach Stebbs. I remember multiple times coming to halftime and them just – kind of throwing the game plan aside and said, all right, this is what works. This is what we're going for. So no egos about your game plan and really not too many egos on the entire offense from, you know, receiver to the other side of receiver because everyone just wanted to win. And I think that was very critical. And that's why most of our success happened, I believe. And Carney will able to convert the field goal there. So we are all tied up at 10 midway through the second quarter. Going to kick off here and get the ball back in the hands of the Tartan offense. Also on this call, we have defensive end Cam Brown. Cam, do you want to touch on your thoughts coming into this game, how you felt, how you were able to, you know, kind of navigate that offensive line? It looks like they have some pretty big guys up there, pretty good amount of, of experience. But as we'll see throughout the game, you were able to, you know, flash and show that that superstar ability that we, we saw throughout your career. Through the week of, through the week of practice, uh, was able to get – prepared and, and locked in and, and ready to go against the different types of things uh, that they were doing. And I didn't get doubled quite as much this year as I did the next two years, but just knowing, um, you know, the type of blocks that I, I would be, be getting and having Ian and Lee on the inside, um, knowing that they could help take some pressure off of me uh, was huge. But the, the biggest part was just having to be able to go or go against our offensive line in practice um, particularly being able to go against Bocce really uh, had to make sh made me make sure that uh, I was very on point with all, all the techniques and things that I was doing and um, just really opening up all of the things that I was capable of doing so that no matter how I was getting blocked or um, what they were trying to do, I was going to have a counter or a way to stop it. Yeah, Cam, another one of, one of those members of the, the defensive line, you know, Definitely a unique skill set. Um, maybe probably didn't have a body that was similar to anybody else. You know, great length, able to to use the strength in his hands and, and pass rush moves. I know you guys spent a lot of time in practice, you know, working on getting off blocks. And I know you guys went into it with the mentality that you're not going to let any one person block you. So, like you touched on, if if they're going to single you and, you know, they're going to pretty much treat you with a lack of respect, they think one guy's going to be able to block you. You see here dipping underneath, dipping the shoulder, getting around the edge. And, don't necessarily get contact on the quarterback, but as we'll see throughout the game, the the pocket starts to get smaller and smaller, and he he can really feel it. And you know, I'm sure he was at least a little bit rush, rushing through his progressions as you guys kept bearing down on him. Andrew, I'm keeping I'm rewinding this while they talk because this is a huge play. Mm -hmm. Do you remember this at all? I know you remember catching the ball, but any idea what took you to where you got the ball, or did it just happen? Um, the ball did kind of come to me, but um, nonetheless, with how high I'm able to jump, it's pretty easy catch. Um, and then I get a lot of grief because a lot of people said I should have taken it to the house instead of, you know, running out of bounds. But I did want our offense to get that touchdown to begin. So that's just kind of the selfless player that I am. But um, nonetheless, like this, um, these routes that they were running, it wasn't anything crazy. And our scout team did an amazing job. So every single time they were running a route, we knew what was coming and we were prepared. So it was just being in the right spot in the right time and the quarterback just assuming that I wasn't going to make the play. Bill got a cut back and house that. <laughs> hey, I well, think Justin, know. Justin, you will have your time for interception returns. We can get to you in the second half. Don't you worry. But no, I, I think it speaks to, to Andrew, to your athleticism and able to read in the quarterback's, quarterback's eyes. We can really see from this view, you know, we, we can piece together what the quarterback saw, what he, what he was trying to do with the ball. And, you know, if you didn't get it down, it looked like Ace also had a shot on the backside, but able to sneak underneath there. And, and like you touched on, this is something that you knew coming into the game. You knew this was a go-to route for them and able to lean on the coaching and the preparation and able to show up on game day with it. 
So now we have a, a sudden change and game's tied up at 10. Rob, what do you, what's your mindset when you get the ball in the red zone, sudden change, big rivalry game like this? What's, you know, what's your approach to operating out of the red zone immediately? I feel like every possession we had, whether we started in the red zone or not, we were thinking touchdown. I mean, that was always my goal was touchdown or bust. Uh, but whenever we were in the red zone, I mean, I was always just thinking we just need to make a few play, like, you know, two, three big plays or maybe just one. Uh, again, we're always going for a touchdown. But those interceptions, fumble recoveries, turnovers always uh, made it better for us. I felt like momentum was a huge factor in a lot of the scores we had. Um, yeah, it was always nice getting the ball close, though. Yeah, and we can't – we don't have sound on, on the tape right now, but you can hear if you listen to the, the version with sound, you can hear the fans. It's – the momentum's going back and forth. You can definitely feel the energy. I, I think this is probably the biggest crowd that we played in in front of all year, and it's not like there was, you know, 50,000 people in the stands, but there's definitely a buzz in, in the stadium, and I know most of the players are going to feed off that. You can feel it going back and forth. Not that Not that we needed any extra motivation or any extra juice, but definitely a buzz in the stadium. Everyone – Everyone is aware of what's on the line here. And I think, you know, from an overall perspective, Carnegie Mellon would be pretty happy to, you know, at this point be tied up. It's going to flip here in a second, but they're at least keeping the game close. You always hear for, you know, the underdogs in a big rivalry game, they want to shorten the game. They want to, you know, force the other team to play at their pace. And as we were coming in at 9-0, and and they didn't necessarily have a playoff berth to play for, but this is their Super Bowl. They know if they beat us that they're taking our – our dreams and our goals away. So at least initially they were happy with the performance and, you know, able to find the end zone here and get up 17, 10, which is huge after being down 10, nothing, you know, early in the second quarter, able to come back and, and punch them back in the mouth and get up 17, 10. With a beautifully executed power play with a shout out to Ryan Marlau for uh, having that, uh, Great little chip block. It's just enough to uh, get the guy out of the way, and Jacob Burke's able to take it in for a score along with three different Carnegie Mellon defenders. defenders. That was me, dude. Oh, that was you? Sorry. <laughs> guys look alike. I got poor quality I got poor. here. I think the either one or two plays before that, we saw another QB draw. Bocci, what are your thoughts on that play? How do, how do the offensive linemen feel about it? I know you guys are definitely able to execute it you know, pretty well throughout the game. How does that, you know, slot into your overall O-line play? Oh, it, it was great because it slowed down the pass rush for uh, later plays because it was always in the uh, back of those defensive linemen's heads. Personally, from a blocking scheme execution, I didn't care for it too much because I had to kind of get beat to the outside. It was kind of an iffy play where I had to let the guy get upfield, and I didn't care too much for that because my lateral movement ability. But uh, I know definitely a lot of those guys like getting downfield uh, kind of – kind of sucked a little bit when we weren't allowed to cut as much downfield, uh, I believe, my senior year or whenever the rule changed. But, uh, no, I know those guys really liked it. And we it was it was one of our bread and butter plays, and we executed it well, I think. Yeah, it was, a, it was definitely a staple throughout the year, and, and we definitely see it executed well throughout this game. So Carnegie's, Carnegie's got the ball back. They've given up 17 straight points, and, you know, they're – starting to see us flex our muscles a little bit and realize there's a reason that we're nine and zero. there's a reason that we are eventually going to go to the playoffs and they're seeing how strong of a team we are in all three phases. So we see here, see here a little quick game, see senior captain Cody Calhoun flash in there. We haven't heard from Cody yet. Cody, overall thoughts on the game. How'd you feel at this point, if you can remember and, you know, what was your confidence level as far as going up against this, you know, relatively high powered Carnegie Mellon offense? Yeah, we felt good. Um, I mean, I kind of – I'm echoing what everyone else has been saying about our defense, but we all felt good about the players we had in every uh, phase of the game. We all believed in the plan that the coaches gave us. Um, so, yeah, we knew we were the better team coming in. It was just kind of a matter of keeping their stars under control between their running back and their number one receiver. Um, so, obviously, we had the slower start. But then I think especially after Andrew's interception, we kind of turned the tables and really got momentum our way. This was a big uh, – big drive for us to see if we could get another stop and just kind of keep things going for the offense. So we felt pretty good at this point. Yeah. And we see here, Mellon pulls out the little inside shuffle screen, whatever you want to call it. And not sure we had the best contain or attack angles there, but 
you know, that that's just kind of a reminder, even though we've ripped off 17 straight points against these guys, they do have weapons. They do have talent and experienced players and they're, they're able to respond and, you know, come back with, with a vengeance for the most part. So one, th- one thing I want to touch on, we also have Luke Bedell cornerback on this call. Luke, at this point, you've, you've pretty much only been in on special teams. I know due to injuries, you're going to pop in here and, and make some big plays for us on defense at the end. But from, I guess, from the sidelines and a special teams perspective, how much does the energy of the game play into how you're executing and, and what are your overall thoughts on just staying loose, you know, throughout the game? Yeah, as a, as a backup, you always have to be ready to, you know, have your number called and be ready to play. Um, and I just, you know, having, having been on special teams, it definitely helps to kind of stay loose and feel the energy of the game. Um, and then just like when your number is called, uh, like it will soon, you know, you just, you get excited, you know, that the coaches are going to put you in a good spot to succeed. And, you know, you just go out and you just make plays, you know, you just do the best you can. And, um, you know, definitely being on special teams helps you get loose and, you know, just getting ready to get in there. So. Yeah. And coach Lally, could you touch on how important it is to, to have depth at, you know, well, actually, we'll come back to that. I think we have a, a bigger play here that Justin McMahon can can help us narrate. So, Coach, if you want to let the tape roll, and we're going to see Justin here make a maybe surprisingly good play in coverage. It was a weird, like, RPO-looking play. Um, and so I bit pretty hard on the run, and quarterback still pull it, uh, pulled it back and threw it to the tight end who was barely, I don't know, like a few yards downfield, and Somehow I ended up making a play on this and just jumped up and it just landed right in my hands. Um, I think the best part about this play, I didn't let the quarterback tackle me though. That was the <laughs> biggest achievement here. Um, if only I could have made the tight end miss then I would have been gone, but well, maybe not. We'll see. We would have juries out on that, but I don't know. It was, yeah, it was just a good play. I think it was good to get our offense back on the field and um yeah, be able to get some points. Yeah, and I'm, I'm sure they watched the Geneva game when you housed it, so I'm sure they practiced on stopping you. They, they could have, they could only hope to contain you and keep you out of the end zone. I'm they sure. had to make sure they took the right angles because they had no <laughs> idea. Yes, yeah, so what we're what we're alluding to a couple weeks earlier, we had played a night game on the road in Geneva, and Justin was able to pick off a pass, which is was it a pass or a fumble recovery? one of those because it was we were facing the triple option offense and Justin was able to get his hands on the ball and run it was at least 70 yards wasn't it it, was, it seemed like pretty much the whole field and 60 able to find yards was yeah. it <laughs> the way to to get it done so couldn't do it without uh without Lion Banathy all the all those guys on defense Ian <laughs> definitely Ian I was gonna say it it felt like 90 yards <laughs> Timing wise, is probably, I mean, it was, felt like eternity. So we see here offense able to, to get the ball back. And like I said earlier, especially in rivalry games, any football game, really, if you look at the, the turnover battle, the team that's going to be able to win the turnover battle, it's vast majority of those games are going to be able to come out on top. So at least to this point, we've been able to, to get our hands on the ball from a defensive perspective and, and get it back over to our offense and hopefully get a chance to extend the lead here. We see keep, you know, keeping running on the ground, keep powering away with the offensive line. Justin Fan, how do you stay focused throughout a game when, you know, you're not necessarily seeing the volume of passes or the activity that you normally do, but, you know, the offense is still being productive? Um, I don't think that was really a problem for me. I know we had, like, a bunch of good guys on offense, um, so we always spread the ball out. It wasn't like a I need to get this many touches per game kind of thing. Just kind of just, you know, feel it out, and then when I get my opportunity, I'll get it. Um, but we had a bunch of players on offense, um, very diverse group at wide receiver. And of course we could run the ball with both backs. So that wasn't really much of a problem. There we see Rob able to find in the court of the end zone, just a little bit outside of the reach. I, I can say that we will come back to that area of the field and, Later on in the game, we're able to convert and, and find a soft spot in the coverage there. Coach Slash, could you could you touch on, you know, how easy is it for you as a coaching staff to adjust in game, and how much of a role do the players play in that, and how important is it that they're flexible and able to adapt to, you know, not only the game plan we initially set out, but also react to what the defense is showing on game day. 
Well, with Carnegie Mellon, it, it's, it's pretty much year to year, it's the same thing. But that being said, every time the guys come off the field and the sideline, we have, you know, the offensive line sits down together, the receivers and backs and quarterbacks, everybody gets together and they talk about, are they doing anything differently than what we'd anticipated? And if so, then how do we want to go about and, and attack it? Just, it just so happened that with, with Mellon, they really didn't do anything that we hadn't expected. And we just kept going back to you know, the, the strengths and, and guys like Justin Fan, who, as you're going to see, makes more plays coming up. And D. Fran is going to make some plays. And we're going to keep seeing the ball to, to Burke. And A.A. Ron's going to get a couple of carries as well. And Kuda's is going to carry it. So we'll have the, the capability and, and flexibility to – change or adjust if need be. Um, and we're certainly open to, to listen to what the guys have to say, because quite honestly, they're smarter than we are. Uh, and, and what they say, they're going to see some stuff out on the field. And, and we'll certainly take to heart what they have to say and, and adjust if we need to. So, Coach Lally, we we're about to touch on it earlier, but we'll circle back now. How important is it for, you know, at least for the DB room to to be not only four strong with starters on the field, but also have depth behind them? And, you know, what role does that next man up mentality play throughout a game? Only in the DB room, it's uh, it's it's all across the board, offense, defense. Um, the next guy's got to be ready to play. You got to prepare like you're a starter. And, you know, this, this, this team in 2017 was, um, you know, probably one of the toughest and most selfless teams that I've ever been around because um, they all prepared like they were starters. No one cared who got the credit and they just prepared every single week and just got after it. And if someone went out, someone came in, I mean, from, you know, guys coming off injuries to, getting hurt and stepping up and making big plays. It just didn't matter. especially on the D line where you're having, you know, consistent rotations and getting different guys in there. We see Cam Brown able to to chop his way through there and get a sack. And Cam, how much does how much of a role does momentum play on the D line? How much how much does that play into your confidence from play to play or is it more kind of a, a steady heart rate for you? I think for the the most part it's pretty consistent and steady that I'm confident in what I'm able to do, but I I feel that once I get a sack or, or a pressure, then I can really get rolling from there and that there's not much they can do to stop me besides uh, throwing more guys at me. Yeah, absolutely. And we saw in that last play, you know, Bandithy, you were able to get through and, and at least make the initial stop. But, Andrew, how important is it to, to know that you have 10 other guys on that defense rallying to the ball and, you know, the whole concept of the gang tackle coming in there? Oh, I mean, that was the point of emphasis from the first day I stepped on campus freshman year is that 11 hats in the ball every play, no matter where you are. And, um, yeah, I mean, you said it right. Like, I could guarantee you that 90% of our tackles were game tackles. Solo tackles weren't a thing in our defense, and that's why we made big plays, because everyone was playing football at the same time. And you could ignore that drop right there. Yeah, I was going to say, we, <laughs> we have the man of the hour. We can watch. You only got one hand on it. We'll give you – we'll cut you some slack there. But, no, it's – it's important. It's still an important play being able to knock it down. I think any, if you ask any quarterback out there, they would much rather only have to focus on the DBs. You know, as soon as you get the linebackers, especially a, 
a taller linebacker like yourself clogging up those passing lanes, it makes their job, you know, infinitely harder. Plus that vertical. <laughs> you already know. Andrew, there, there's a, there's kind of a, I don't know if it's a funny story about this drive or not, but um, a couple plays ago, there was, there was a third down and the pass was um, incomplete and they ended up with a first down. Uh, there, there was a roughing the passer call. Um, and the official gave us the number and um, he gave us the wrong number. Uh, <laughs> um, so he said there was a roughing the passer call on Andrew Lee. So obviously third and long incomplete pass, um, you know, the, the guys will tell you. And, and as you know, I, I don't really have a, have a big tolerance for, for silly mistakes. Um, so I, I really let Andrew Lee have it. Um, and, and to his credit, he, he took it. <laughs> um, the roughing the passer call was not on Andrew Lease. It was on Tyler Bushman. And Tyler allowed his teammate to take that. Um, <laughs> the, the, basically all the way into the locker room before half um, because it kept the drive alive. And they actually, I think they score a touchdown here. Yeah, they're able to, to find the end zone. And I... I hadn't remembered it before. I do vividly remember Lease taking a beating, taking a whipping on the sidelines from you. And maybe kind of a weird transition, but I think Coach Miller, one of the one of the best things about our defense, and I think it started with you, the one the one line that you had thrown out that really stuck with me is you were gonna coach us in the style that you wanted us to play. And that kind of justified your your messaging and and all your energy that you brought on the sidelines. And I think most of the guys would agree with me that we saw how passionate and how intense you were on a week to week basis from a, a preparation standpoint, a practice standpoint, it could be Thursday morning at 6 30 AM. You were going to bring the juice and that, you know, in turn trickle down to definitely the defense. And I would imagine it also played a role on, on the offense and special teams as well. So I think you can see that we did our best to kind of uphold that with, with guy, you know, most of the guys on this call, these are the senior leaders and they took their lead from you and they were able to, apply that on the field week to week. So we see here offense is going to be taking a knee and we're headed into halftime here so just to to recap it's it's a little tough we don't have a scoreboard on the screen here but going into halftime case is up 20 to 17 I don't think anyone would have been surprised if going into the game you you heard that'd be the halftime score you know records aside these two teams are are very talented huge rivalry game and as you can see Carnegie Mellon was not scared of us at all and I don't think at any at any position they were they weren't going to back down from us and you know, some pretty good swings in the first half. Carnegie was up 10 nothing at one point, and then we came back. We had a 10-point lead, and, you know, it settles down by halftime, 20-17. to 17, And it's only up from here as far as the energy and, and the, you know, anxiety that goes on with this game. We'll see. It continues to be kind of a, a heavyweight bout going back and forth, and some of the biggest, most notable plays of the Coach Debs, do you remember what was your mindset going into the locker room and, you know, what did you tell the guys as far as how we need to approach the second half? Was it, you know, business as usual? Is it, is it foot on the gas pedal, maybe all the above? I think it, it went as we expected it to go. Um, you know, offensively, we had six series. We had one punt. The other five series we got in the red zone. Uh, the only thing I was disappointed in is we only scored two touchdowns. Um, we had two field goals and, and one missed field goal. So, uh, that was, I think for that year, I think we were really good as far as touchdown percentage in the red zone. So I, I was a little disappointed. We didn't score more touchdowns. Um, and I love Ben Carnoyle, but I hate kicking field goals. I just don't <laughs> lose a lot of games, kicking a lot of field goals. So that was the only disappointing thing on offense. Uh, I, I think our game plan, we, we were pretty solid with and the old line was doing great, really, really well. Um, Rob was a little off. Um, I don't think he was as sharp as he could have been throwing the ball, um, but still very effective and, and ran the ball well. So we liked where we were at and, and the defense caused two big turnovers. We got 10 points off of turnovers. Um, and we knew Carnegie Mellon was, was very good. 
um, they were a really good team. And I think that gets lost um, sometimes because the, over the last, geez, six years, a couple of breaks here and there, a couple of guys not getting injuries, they're in the playoffs a number of times. It just hasn't gone their way. This is a very talented program with, you know, great players and very good coaches. So I felt good. I, I don't remember thinking we had to change things, you know, coach slash coach Miller, coach Lally. I don't know. I, I think we just, I think we liked where we were at and just, we had to keep playing at the intensity level that we were at and just keep making plays and not making mistakes. I, I think is what I remember about the halftime. Okay. So we have second half here. Like I said, close game cases up 20 to 17 and, as we'll see, Mellon is not going to back down at any point throughout the second half. One thing that, that's a theme with Mellon's offense, and we've heard from a couple people talking about it, but they have excessive shifting with, with their tight ends, always in motion. And their tight ends are usually pretty strong, usually pretty big bodies, pretty talented. Zach Lyon, could you go into what are some of the differences in, in technique and you know overall approach when you have a, a tight end lined up with you for pass block and that versus when you're going against a tackle. Sure. Um, tackle, you can kind of be a little bit quicker with them. Um, try to get around them that way. Probably not going to want to try to bulldoze those guys, Cam style or Ian style. Um, whereas tight end, sometimes you can kind of go right through them, um, speed to power kind of thing. Probably not going to get away with a quick move there. You just kind of before the play starts, got to see who you're lined up against and strategize as necessary. And there we see Banathy making another big play. And, you know, as, as a consistent theme, it seems like every, every other play, I don't think there's any one stretch where we got one linebacker, one D lineman, one DB making four straight plays in a row. It seems like every single time there's a different guy flash and different guys showing up on tape. And here we see Mario running all over God's green earth within our punt return strategy. Justin Fan, you were pretty much our rock solid punt return all year. How'd you feel about punt returns in this game, if you can remember? And, you know, how important is it for you to, to get positive yardage and set the offense up for a chance at success? Yeah, so if I remember correctly, they were, um, I think they were directionally kicking. They were kicking straight to the sideline, um, trying to prevent returns. So that's why we had two of us back there, where throughout the year normally we'd have one. Um, but when you're back there, you mainly focus on getting the ball, securing the ball for your offense, and then if you can't get anything extra after that. But Yeah, and I don't – unfortunately, I don't think we were able to really pop a big one. I know in the fourth quarter, Justin, you're going to have one where you, you break it off a little. I think it might have got called back for for a penalty. Here we see Rob running old reliable, old QB draw once again. Rob, at this point, are you taking yards any way you can get them? Um, do you feel like you need to get a couple passes off to, to stay warm, to stay in rhythm, or is it, are you fine with just, you know, pounding the rock and getting consistent yardage? It was always nice to get a few completions, but whenever we were moving the sticks, I always felt confident I could throw the ball. Um, we had a couple of good plays in the first half. I don't think I was feeling like I needed anything. Um, we were just moving the ball and I just wanted to score any way we could. And if I had to run the ball, um, I would do it. Yeah. And something we've we've saw it through a couple spurts in the first half, and you'll see it pop up. It's a little tough when we have the the plays spliced together like this. But Coach Slash, could you touch on the importance of being able to go tempo and being able to vary the speed and the frequency at which we're calling plays on the offensive side? Yeah, the ability Andrew to go tempo can be really tough on a defense. And we, we've shown a little bit of a tendency. We like to do that after a big play and, and try to catch defenses when they're scrambling a little bit or most often if they're trying to make substitutions. Mellon, you know, for a while they even had wristbands where they'd be taking time looking at their wristbands to find out what they were going to run. So we would go ahead and get something in to, to try to hurry up the pace. And, and we didn't do a ton in terms of schematics when we went with our hurry up. But – if we felt that we had a defense on the ropes, we would go ahead and use it. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been pretty good for us, particularly with a, a, a guy like Rob, who's, who's a threat to run it as well. Bocci, from an offensive line perspective, can you see it in the, the eyes of the defense, especially the guys across from you, when, when we're going tempo, 
does that really get to them? Is that kind of a mentality thing? And then, you know, also physically with, they just might not be, you know, in good enough shape to be able to handle that. Oh, for sure. Especially if they don't have a up-tempo offense they face in practice, we find that they struggle with it greatly because we practice it, you know, basically every day in practice and we're ready to go and we're up and roaring. And it's no difference to us, but to them, sometimes it's foreign. And after three or four plays quick, they start getting tired, and especially in this game where we were just kind of heavy run diet and a lot of banging heads with each other. They're starting to get sick of us. And most teams at this point, you could tell they'd start quitting. And, you know, a lot of the teams we would play, they would slowly die off. But Mellon, and with the exception of a few others, Mellon never quit. And they were in it to the bitter end. And they always thought they had a chance. And you can see how hyped they get when they make a good play and a good stop, or in this case, a fumble. But, um, no, you could definitely wear a defense out with that tempo. And if you get two or three drives of the tempo, you could basically almost mail it in sometimes. Mm-hmm. We see there there was just a little issue with the, the center quarterback exchange. Rob, obviously we're primarily a shotgun team. Is it is it truly that different and that difficult to get under center and, you know, take more of a traditional snap? Or is, is that just something if you rep it out, then it's it's a pretty seamless transition? I think if you rep it out, yeah, it is. But I didn't really ever rep it out. Um, <laughs> so, <laughs> I mean, I, if you just kind of got to focus on it. I mean, I think in situations like that, I am thinking about other things and then maybe pull out too quick. I'm sure it was my fault. Gage always got it back. But I once I'd fumble it, though, I, I don't think I really ever do it again that same game because I'm pretty focused on putting my hands under there. Yeah, Rob, it's, it's – it's, it's, it's difficult for a shotgun quarterback to go or any center, no doubt about it. And Rob, do you remember, I don't know if it was after the game or like during films, because the on the quarterback draw, you slid and you usually never slide. And you said something like, I guess I shouldn't have slid, you know, to get the first, to get the first. But that was, yeah, that, that was, yeah, that was a big play. Disappointing. Play. Disappointing. Yeah, turn the ball over. The one, the one time I remember sliding when I was regretted it was my sophomore year against Waynesburg because I got turf burn up my entire shin because I was wearing ankle socks. So we see Banathy making another tackle there. Banathy, how did you feel about your coverage skills overall? Is that something that you improved on throughout your career? Did you kind of come into case knowing that you'd – have the agility and you know more of the top end speed to be able to run with some of these guys so um I knew that Justin wasn't a cover guy and I knew he had to have a cover guy so I kind of <laughs> jumped into that role I wouldn't consider myself a great cover guy but um you know when Justin and I were freshmen and sophomores we had um another athletic guy who would do that same thing we had a guy that maybe wasn't as athletic but he ran the defense so we kind of played honestly kind of like just how they did and um yeah, I mean, we ran seven on seven every single day. We got tons of reps. We played a lot of teams that like to rely on the pass. And, you know, just over time, you just kind of get used to it. But to be honest, I played defense because I love stopping the run. And I think that was why we were so successful. Everybody on our defense loved playing run defense. I think yeah, we had I think a good template to go off of with uh, Weisberg and Gavin from uh, a few years before. But I think we probably uh, were a little better by the end of it. Exactly. Up for debate, but... <laughs> Yeah, I'm not sure if they would agree, but you know what? We're not watching them play right now. It's not what's important. So I, I think similar to to what we were seeing on offense is, you know, Mellon's really pounding the ball. They know they have a, a solid senior running back there. Cody, with you being one of our safeties that's generally going to be 15, 20 yards off the ball, how do you how do you stay focused throughout a game, you know, knowing that they've they've run the ball 10 out of the last 12 plays, but they still have a guy like, you know, Prather on the outside who could bust it at any moment. Yeah, I think it's important to just stay true to your technique and the game plan. Um, a lot of times with the great linebackers and D line that we have, they're going to be handling the run. And by the time it gets to us, um, they're already making yards anyway. So in situations that we're deep thirds or whatever it may be, and we're playing the deep ball, it's important for us to stay true to that because those are going to be the plays that make the big difference. Those like three to four plays that change the total momentum of the game that you never know when they're going to come. So just kind of staying true to what we're, what the plan was everyone doing our job. Cause that's really what the whole point of everything is. We've got a game plan. We like, if everyone does their job, we're going to come out successful. 
Absolutely. Yeah, I think that's it's an important you know pillar of any defense and becomes pretty clear when when teams aren't able to stick to that and they're not able to stay true to their roots and stay true to the game plan. So one unique thing that, that people might not realize is that our coaching staff is for any given game, assuming there's, I guess, normal facilities, our coaching staff will be somewhat split between on the field and, and up in the box, having more of a view that, that we have right now. And Coach Lally, do you, I know you're typically up in the booth. Do you have a preference and in, in what are some of the benefits of being up high and being able to you know, see the whole field maybe a little better than you do if you're down on field level? Uh, you see uh, the whole field uh, compared to just half the field. Um, I've done both. And, um, you know, when you're up in the box, you see everything and um, you can make adjustments. And, um, you know, that's that's really what, uh, you know, the people on the sideline rely on is for you to see what, what happened on the play um, to relay it so they can communicate that back to the players and all that stuff and, use their information as well to make adjustments. Coach, Coach Debs, how important is it to have, you know, people that you can trust and rely on up in the booth and how do you utilize them from, you know, in your case, mostly an offensive perspective, but also for special teams? You got to trust them. Um, you know, they have an angle that they can pick up things that you can't and you have to, you know, trust their communication skills that they're going to be able to relay what's going on. Um, you know, down on the field and, and you have to have a guy up there that's not afraid to, to make suggestions. You know, it's one thing that you can see things going on, but you got to communicate those things. Um, and if you have ideas, you got to get them out there fast. Cause the, it's the one thing that I don't know if you guys, you know, it, it's a fast game and the time you have to make decisions um, is maybe five, eight seconds. That's how much time you have. So the communication has to be great um, and it has to be accurate. So it's, it's really important. Yeah. And I think we, we can all think of some situations where, you know, for whatever reason, the communication is not flowing. We can think of Illinois Wesleyan where due to the weather, whatever factors were at play, coach Miller's headset gave obviously important that you guys have people up in the booth that you can trust and, and rely on. And, you know, maybe another thing coach Debs that you could provide insight on uh, how important is it to have a coaching staff, that is consistent year over year. And, you know, Coach Slash, Coach Miller, and Coach Lally have been here for a couple of years now, some of them, you know, over 10 years at, at least. Um, how valuable is that to have guys that you can trust on staff and, you know, guys that are comfortable enough to, to bring their own thoughts to the table? Yeah, I think it's why we've had such sustained success or a, a big reason is because we have had continuity. Um, we have guys that get along together, um, work well together, recruit well, which is probably the most important thing. Um, and, I, and I think if you asked, you know, certain position groupings, you know, there, there's a different reaction from, from the groups that have had that same guy for four years and the groups that have had transition um, and not had the same guy consistently. Um, I, I think that the players have a better experience if they have the same person coaching them for four years, because they know what to expect and, um, you know, there's a consistency there that that just works, that, that people feel comfortable with. Unless they're consistently being jerks. But, uh, <laughs> good people, so. You see here, Carnegie's been able to, to string together a little, little bit of an extended run, and that leads perfectly into this really amazing interception by Pat Crossy. And, and Pat, I'll get out of your way here. You want to take us through what you saw and, you know, how big of a play was this and how excited were you to be able to get the ball back to the offense? Yeah. I mean, we touched on it earlier that number one was their go-to guy in the passing game. And all week during practice, we practiced clouding number one and then coach Miller called the right play here. I mean, right coverage here. And then I ended up just making a play kind of glad I laid out for it because a couple of weeks earlier against Teal, I picked one off and uh, ended up fumbling right back to him. So <laughs> I got down here, just got the ball back to the offense. Yeah, no, that, that was a huge play. Like I said, Mellon had been driving a little bit. And one thing you'll see with our defense is we got athletes all over the board, you know, from the D-line all the way all the way to the back end with Pat. So they threw it up, and we were able to let our athleticism, you know, flow through the scheme. And I think one of the better things about our defense is, for the most part, most of the time we're going to be able to get the calls in pretty quickly. And, you know, due to our preparation, we're really going to be able to let the athletes shine. And guys aren't thinking back there. They're not confused. They're not – 
second guessing. And I think you'll hear a lot of coaches say that the the key to playing fast on defense is streamlining stuff and having your guys be confident in the plays that that they're running. But at this point, we still have a twenty to seventeen game. Case Western up by three points, and the third quarter is actually pretty pretty uneventful. Uh, neither team was actually able to score. Goose eggs on both sides, and it's the only quarter that that happened. And if you look, it was it was really all the game action came in two quarters throughout this game. So the first quarter only saw three points from Mellon. Third quarter saw zero points from either team. And, you know, with the score ended up in, in the 40s and 30s, the second, fourth quarter and overtime are really when, when the fireworks started to happen. Bachi, do you want to touch on kind of, you know, the importance of having an even keel during one of these games when it's so much back and forth, rivalry game added in? How important is it for especially you guys up front to, to just be consistent and continue to execute Yeah, I don't think you can let your emotions take you too high. Or, and you can't obviously – get too low when you're struggling because you have to go out there and just the next play and you can't be focused on what happened before you have to be able to keep moving forward because there's a lot of moving parts to this offense I mean we only had a couple different plays I know the receivers I'm not gonna pretend to know all the routes by any means they had a lot more on their plates but it was still a lot because you had to identify your front find your linebackers find who was your help if you're going to adjust you know out calls and whatnot you can see here I actually remember this just a side note this is one of the few runs I actually remember watching from Rob go because it was so, such a long one. But uh, I know here I got a little excited, but I think our group, we all stayed pretty level. And that was all, there was nothing new for us and it was pretty consistent. D Derek Slash, do you, do you remember, because we, um, we had a, a plan when they came in with their four man front and it was very specific what they did. And I think we only had two plays, Derek. I think we had quarterback power and quarterback draw. Is that, is that the way you remember it? Because this is yeah. definitely something that when we, we saw we actually, in four people, we checked to it. But, yeah, they bring their linebacker up here. And we, we, we scored in the first half. One of the play – Rob scored on a QB power. And this is typical power. You got Aaron who's kicking out the outside backer against their 41 box. And we know that we're going to pull up onto the Mike backer. And then, uh, you know, they play a lot of man. And if we get through that second level – and you guy run, got a guy running in space free. So, yeah, either draw or or the QB power was the the the, the check that we actually had in mind to go ahead and, and run if they got into their forty one box, which they tend to do when you get on the other side of the fifty. Yeah, and this is this is another thing that we lose without having sound on this, but I can vividly remember we had kind of it was a little back and forth, and there wasn't a whole lot of huge momentum plays you know, over the past couple minutes in the game. And Rob broke off that run. And I vividly remember him. He got pushed out of bounds or went out of bounds right in front of our, our section of the stands where all of our parents were and some of our loyal, loyal friends up on the parking garage. I remember Rob gave, gave kind of a little fist bump to him. And the whole place is, I guess, as loud as 3,000 people can be erupted. And I remember thinking in my head, we're going to beat this team. And you'll see it'll, it'll go south for us here in a little, in a little bit. But at that moment, I had I had no doubt that we were going to be able to win this game. And I think it all at this point kind of flowed through Rob, you know, Rob being a quarterback, being a returner and being able to break off plays like that when the offense is just kind of, you know, puttering along for a little bit. It, it spoke to, to how consistent he was and how he was able to, you know, be an emotional leader on the field and be the leader that the quarterback needs to be for any any productive offense. I think we have a young Colt Morgan making an appearance here this next. Oh, week. yep. That one is start on the play sheet coming up here. And when I watched it, I, I thought, you know, if if in some ideal world we were able to take Colt Morgan from last year and drop him in on this offense, because I, I think at this point we didn't really have that, that – this will sound crazy the, – the Randy Moss type player, the stretch the field, the taller, longer body. And, you know, that's definitely what Colt was able to bring. And we see him here able to – I don't necessarily see the flag. I'm certainly biased. But Colt's able to go up and, you know, use his side. Rob's able to put a ball up there and, and let his player go and get it. Rob, do you want to touch on how, how valuable it is to, to have a guy like Colt where you know you can – you know, you don't need to make a perfect throw. You can throw it up and let the, the big body athlete go up there and get it. It's uh, very valuable. I mean, we didn't – he didn't play a ton that year. Um, but I remember when Herb was playing, I would just do that pretty much all sophomore year, just throw it up and hopefully Herb makes a play. 
um, but I haven't called out there. If he was there for multiple years, um, I think it would have he would have been even uh, more of a weapon. But yeah, I mean, I like throwing it up to Justin too. It makes it harder. Yeah, and that, that's the weird thing, and we'll see if the, you know, Justin was able to still, in a lot of ways, be a jump ball receiver. You know, you don't necessarily have to be six foot four, six foot five. It's a lot of it is body positioning, and Justin was absolutely a master of you know being able to work angles and body positioning and and get himself in positions to make those catches. So defense back out on the, out on the field, and Ian, do you want to touch on? you know, going through a game, do you feel like you were able to get stronger in the third and fourth quarter and, you know, keep ramping up through the second half or were you more of kind of a, a consistent flow throughout the game? Um, I think we, uh, I think as a unit, we probably melded more, uh, more towards the end. We got comfortable with the offense, you know, it got, you really have to get accustomed to, um, to that, to the running back speed, you know, he was, um, he was their star athlete and we were more concerned with containing, you know, containing big plays. So obviously you play a little skittish, you uh, play, a little, play a little reserved. I think in the third quarter, you know, the third and fourth quarters, we kind of got our reins together and, and kind of just let loose, played our type of defense. You know, we weren't really running any crazy schemes. We were just using our athleticism and just like having fun, I guess. So this was another punt where we didn't necessarily pull out our, our full pump block uh, that we had schemed up. But I guess just overall in general, Coach Debs, is is this a game where you feel the need to pull out maybe some more unique, aggressive plays, whether it be a trick play on offense, a block punt on special teams? Do you feel like, you know, the, the stakes necessitate that? Or is it more of a, you know, you can't necessarily plan for it. You just go for whenever the moment calls for it. No, I think you have to plan for it, but always against Mellon because they were so sound in, in all aspects of the game. It was really difficult to trick them. Um, so, you know, it, yeah, it, it just wasn't – I don't like calling trick plays just to do it. If we're going to call them, there has to be a high percentage of working. And it was really difficult to find those types of plays against Mellon. It was much more, I think, easier – sounder for us because we knew what they did and to try and exploit that because we knew what they did we knew they were to have trouble with the quarterback draw it just because of how they played their base defense and our quarterback was a great runner so I, those things made sense more sense to me than just trying to just trying to throw something out there to trick them because they're they're smart kids that they, they don't get tra as, as we are that's what made the game so much fun because we had similar types of players, played similar styles of football. Yeah, Bachi, is that something that you saw as well? Can you see that, you know, the similarities between us and Mellon, maybe not as much as we'd like to admit, but is it a similar type of type of player that they have on their side? I'd, I'd say so. I think our guys, especially in this year, were a lot more athletic on the defense side of the ball going against them. I mean, Cam Brown's probably the best guy blocked in four years, as well as, you know, button heads with uh, Ian and – or. Justin and uh, Banathy, but those guys, I mean, they're very similar to us. They were smart. They played sound football. So you weren't going to catch, you know, three guys in the C gap or you weren't going to get all those easy plays like Coach Depp was saying where you get a break. I mean, you had to beat them straight up. And I think we were overall more athletic and a little bit stronger, but that could be open to interpretation depending <laughs> on who you ask. Yeah. And Burke, I'll I'll ask you the same question I asked Ian. Do you feel like you get stronger, to, you know, as the game goes? Are you a guy that needs 15, 20 carries and you're going to, you know, settle into a, a rhythm and, and really try and wear down a defense as you get into the third and fourth quarter? I don't know. That's a tough question. I mean, I think getting into a rhythm is always great. Um, but, I mean, I, I just think it depends on the game. Like, if the game's – if if the defense is good and it passes, I mean, I think that's great. that's great to throw. And if runs are available, that's great also. But I think it's just dependent – on the flow of the game. I don't think it, I don't think getting into a rhythm is too much of my style. And one thing people might notice, and this will definitely be more of a week to week thing, but I think in general, our offense doesn't necessarily use the traditional passing game involving the running back. Um, Coach Slash, is that something, is that something that you guys have historically done where it's more of the, you know, traditional running back role versus flaring them out, running, more screens and um, I guess bubble routes like some other offenses might. Uh, it, it really depends on, on our personnel. Um, 
one of the schemes that we had done best over the course of the season in particular was a, a boot concept out of two back. And we threw to our back quite a bit in the flat and occasionally we would wheel him. But there are uh, occasions where we will want to max protect with the back and, and take our shots downfield with the, the other four receivers, depending on the personnel that we have in the game. But no, we, we have a decent mix of, of plays that are, you know, the primary or the first read is to a back in the, in the flat. It just, it's going to be dependent on, on our personnel. And because of because of the defense that Mellon played, they played a lot of man. They had the backs covered. So again, you really couldn't trick them with play action, or they were just going to run with the backs. So it really wasn't in our game plan this week to do that. Except we had a special play off of boot that we never sent Burke out, um, and we faked it to him and sent him up the sideline. And you'll you'll see that one coming up. We called it twice. One time, Jacob. I'm sad to say did not do the right thing. And then the next time he did and he was wide open. Yep. We have a big play here and I think, I think it's worth running this one back. Rob, do you want to walk me through, you know, your thoughts as we come out and empty here and you see that Justin's got a, probably a favorable mashup and, you know, he ends up being double covered, but you're still able to thread the ball in there for a touchdown. Uh, I remember on this play, just throwing it as far as I can to the pylon. Um, I just – I can't remember what the play call was or if he was my – I think he was my first look, and I saw him have a step, and I just I just gave him a chance and threw it to the pylon. Yeah, well, whatever you were shooting for, I, th I think you nailed it. Pretty much a perfect throw there, especially considering double coverage. Justin, how difficult is it to have a, a linebacker split out there on you and then, you know, knowing that a safety is over the top? Um, yeah, it was definitely a weird look. I actually didn't think this ball was going to go to me. I kind of – was just running a, a decoy route because I saw that there were two guys over the top. But as soon as I turned my head, I saw a Rob throw the ball, you know, just try to make a play and it worked out perfectly through a perfect ball. Um, I think I nodded to him before just to give him a heads up, just throw him my way a little bit. <laughs> now, if, we could be, if we could be honest for a second, how many plays a game do you look at the quarterback and nod and say that you're going to be open on this route? It's got to be at least 80% of them. And I'm sure there's four other guys on the field doing the same thing, right? Oh, yeah, for sure. For sure. We, we all want a little, <laughs> slice, want to a little slice of the pie. Every receiver says they're open every, after every possession. <laughs> Absolutely. And here you can, you can see from the back view, he's peeking to Hurd. Mm -hmm. And Hurd's guy kind of collisioned him and kind of grabbed him. And then he goes outside and just what just what he said, he just wings it. And the safety just couldn't get back there in enough time. And part of it is because you have Zach Hurd going up the seam. He's got to respect that. So it, it was it was tough having having Zach and, and Justin on the same side running vertical routes. That's that's no easy task to defend. Yeah, and I think if you asked Hurd, he would have, you know, loved to to get in the box score and have a couple catches, but you know, team concept, there's I don't know how many plays, 10, 12 plays in here that you can see Zerd is attracting a lot of attention. He had a huge year, a couple big catches. I know Teal, he absolutely, you know, lit up the field and had a couple long touchdowns. So super valuable having him being able to run up the seam and, and take the attention away. And then, you know, Rob having good eye discipline, whether it was an intentional or just kind of a reaction, but, you know, at least moves the safety off the line a little bit and able to thread the ball in there to Justin. And you know, sometimes on those throws, it's going to be, you know, one or half a step that's going to make the difference. I think Zach set a record this year for um, yards per catch. He was well into the 20s. Yeah, it was crazy. And I think, you know, going back, what we've talked on kind of throughout, he was he was definitely a unique skill set. That's He was a track guy. He's an absolute burner. And I can say he made me feel very slow and inadequate plenty of times. So Rob was definitely able to – to find the times when he had single location, God forbid they put a linebacker or safety on him. It's just not going to work out. And, you know, throughout the year, of course, uh, 10 games and two playoff games, Zerd was a problem for, for a lot of defenses, a lot of different types of players and a lot of different schemes still weren't able to, to tie him down. Just didn't necessarily show up in the box score in this game. Just to catch up on the scoreboard, score is now 27-17, Case Western. We are into the fourth quarter. And again, there's going to be a, a flurry of points coming here. See if they're able to hit a big play to pray there down the middle and, you know, credit to Adrian Cannon able to run him down and doesn't necessarily happen here, but we can think too, 
you know, the year before where Westminster was inside the five yard line and the score might be inevitable, but you never know what's going to, what's going to happen on the goal line. So to the extent that you can keep guys out and force them to punch it in, if not, you're going to have guys like Justin McMahon that are going to recover a fumble and, you know, at that time, save, you know, make a season saving play. So credit to Adrian there being able to, to chase him down to at least make the offense work for it. Like we got Luke Bedell in the game. Now I know Christmas was kind of in and out in the second half with, with injuries, I think to his shoulder, some part of his arm. Luke, do you want to touch on, you know, whether it was difficult to come in and, and get up to game speed? I know you were in on special teams and that kind of gave you a little flavor, but how tough is it to, to drop right into the defense like this? I think, uh, you know, Kevin and, and Adrian also, like the whole game were kind of in and out. So I was kind of filling in for, for both of them wherever they needed, a, needed uh, a little bit of a break. But, yeah, it's definitely tough to, uh, especially down the red zone, to just come right in and, and with a high pressure, pressure situation to make plays. Uh, but you just got to, you know, trust your technique, trust the game plan, you know, trust the coaches they are going to put you in a good spot and, you know, hopefully you go out there and make plays. So, uh, you know, I wasn't really too worried about the, getting in the game and, uh, you know, the position I was in, you know, just trusting my technique and hopefully I could, hopefully I can make a play. Yeah, well, you definitely come up with a big play in overtime and there's another play that isn't necessarily a true defensive play, but we will touch on that when that comes as well. So Carnegie Mellon kind of, you know, like I said, it's not it's not necessarily a guarantee, especially with a tough defense like we have. It's it should be tough. It should get tougher as you get closer to the goal line. Banger's able to get around the corner here and and find his way to the end zone. So that'll make it with the extra point, 27-24. You can see Ian wasn't real happy with with the defense there, but you know it's tough when they hit a big play like that. It's it's tough. You set yourself up for failure, as I'm sure Coach Miller can attest. It's with games, games like this, when you have just a couple guys that are, you know, for all intents and purposes, a home run hitter, uh, whether it's Banger, the linebacker, Prater, the wide receiver, it's tough. You got to try and limit those those run plays over 10 yards and pass plays over 20 yards. As much as you can get rid of those chunk plays, that'll make things easier. Yeah, that goal line stand, that was tough. I know the week before we had a similar scenario against Westminster. We had three really great plays and then on fourth down we gave up a score and same thing happened here so that's really tough as from a defensive standpoint to have three really good plays and then force a force down fourth down where they go for it and then get, give up a score yeah and i remember that westminster one i think they ran a little play action and were able to complete the touchdown pass but like you said it's it's tough to stop a good offense four straight plays especially when they they don't have far to go but if there's 10 situations like that throughout the year, if you can get a stop and force them to kick a field goal on two or three of them, that's, that's huge. It's a big, big motivational boost for the team and also on the scoreboard. Yeah, Cody, you, you good. served as our, our kick returner throughout the year. How, how much did you enjoy that? And, you know, some people would say I'm, I'm one of the leaders of the defense and, you know, I'm out there for 80, 90 plays on that. I don't necessarily care about special teams. How, how much did you, you know, like being out there for kick returns and going after hopefully ripping off a touchdown. I love being out there for kick returns. Um, that was something I was able to do for all four years, or I guess really three years plus one game my junior year. Um, but I really enjoyed it. And it was something that I got to at least contribute a little bit to the offense's starting field position. Um, so even though I didn't get the glory of the touchdowns like Rob and Burke and everyone else, um, I at least felt like I contributed to that in some way. Um, although kind of throughout my whole career, it just turned into a, a way for the whole team to tease me getting caught by kickers and whatnot. So I was never able to uh, rip off a touchdown, probably had way too many kickers tackle me over the years, but still a good time. Yeah, absolutely. Well, while Cody was talking there, we saw Rob was actually brought down with a horse collar tackle. And I think that's the point when, when Rob tweaked his ankle and that, that was kind of something that Rob had to deal with you know, through the rest of this game and, and then also the next two weeks in the playoffs. Rob, do you remember that play and, I guess, walk us through your injury and, and how you were able to overcome that and come back into the game later? Because, I mean, I sprained that ankle a couple – I think I, I'm pretty sure I sprained it on that play, and I remember not really being able or feeling confident to run the ball the rest of the game, um, especially in overtime. So it definitely made it tougher on me. Um, I was throwing off my back foot a lot. But, I mean, I'd played through injuries before. I was not going to let anything take me off the field. <laughs> yeah, I think I think we had a couple guys on our team that the training staff weren't necessarily huge fans of because you guys were, were so, sober, so stubborn and, and so tough. And 
I mean, if there's any game that you need to, to fight through an injury, this is it. Um, you know, playoff berth on the line, playing your biggest rival in a close game. So all credit to you, Rob, being able to, to find a way to get back out there. And, you know, even if you were limited, it maybe wasn't necessarily fully clear to the defense. And I know it provides an emotional boost to, to everyone on the sideline, everyone on the offense. There's kind of a, a quiet confidence when, when the starter is able to power through and get back out there. So definitely kudos to you. And I know that wasn't necessarily fun or felt good, but I think we had a good result here in the end. So Bachi, we're we're into the fourth quarter here. At this point, can you see it in the you know the eyes of the D linemen? Are you guys feeling pretty confident about the work you've put in over three three and a half quarters and and what you had in front of you for the remainder of the game? We were feeling good, but the game was still close, so we weren't feeling that good yet. As you can see, at Ryan Coolidge in, and obviously we get a new quarterback in, so obviously some worries, but you know we trusted Coolidge and everyone here, so we we're just trying to continue to do our job. And like I said earlier, Carnegie Mellon did not quit. They played up until the, you know, the final blow of the whistle on every single play. And you can tell I started noticing probably about a quarter ago, they're starting to get a little chippy and they're really trying to start to do things to, you know, uh, get in our heads and try to disrupt us any way they can. And I know it probably can't be fun getting the ball run all over you and probably, you know, defense giving up more than a couple touchdowns is probably not very fun for them, but. They weren't going to quit, and we knew they weren't. So, Just a reminder, a little catch-up. Case is up 27-24. Midway through the fourth quarter, starting to come down to crunch time. Coach Miller, does your defensive game plan change at all as we, as we you know, get down towards later in the game and perhaps Carnegie is going to get a little more pass-happy than they have earlier at different points? No, I, I think with the score being what it what it was at the time, that that we still expected them to to, to have a balanced attack and still use, you know, the the, the run and the pass to try to move the ball. Um, you know, I, I'm not a not a huge huge believer in changing things with what you do necessarily just always based on the score of the game. Um, it's too many times you see teams soften up and give up big leads. Um, I, I think you need to go with what got you in the position to where, to where, with, to where you're at. Um, so, you know, with it only being a three point game, um, you know, we, we knew we were still going to have to be able to stop both the run and the pass. There we see another, another group tackle, just speaking to the, basically the defensive culture of, you know, it's, are we capable of making a tackle with one guy? Yes. Do we expect to make the tackle with one guy? you can't go into it with that mindset. You need to assume that the tackle is going to be missed. We need 11 hats running to the ball. And especially with a bigger guy like Kuhn, the tight end, having our two middle linebackers being able to smother him there and, and get him down to the ground is, is crucial, especially at this point in the game. Yeah, they're able to hit another big pass to, to number one. And he was definitely their go-to receiver throughout the game. And I know in the week leading up to it, that's exactly what we knew. It's, I guess a little frustrating for, for everyone involved when you know who they're going to, you know what the game plan is, and you're, you're still not able to, to stop it defensively. And it's just a credit to the chemistry that they had on their offense and, you know, the ability of that receiver. There. So we see there, Ian, you picked up one of the, I guess, frequent double teams that you see. What was your approach on, on pass rush? You're obviously a, a big player in the run game, but how were you able to, to push the pocket and hopefully impact the quarterback a little bit as well? Um, basically – uh, to maintain my gap for the most part, we um, I didn't have a lot of ability to uh, to move around with gaps because we um, we we blitzed a lot. I don't know particularly this game that much, but uh, my main responsibility was to push the pocket, uh, double team or not, and maintain my gap just in case. Um, due to all the 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 talent they had, you know, they could break a run at any point down the middle. Or, um, or, or yeah, down any of the A gaps. So my main ability, I mean, it was just pushing the pocket, trying to push the double team and push the, uh, the offensive lineman in, in the quarterback's face, to try to cause some interceptions, try to cause some QB hurries. Yeah, and we see here quarterback, whether he's rushed or not, um, able to make, a I guess, a borderline throw. And Cody Calhoun able to, to flash the athleticism. Cody, we're not going to – we won't give you credit for the pick. We'll give you credit for a, a great play and a – we'll call it a pass break up there. We'll maybe get the foot down next time. But able to get the Carnegie Mellon offense off the field and 
he was fan breaking the one big punt return. I think there might have been a flag that'll that'll call it back, but yeah, you know, this I, this was this was when things started going crazy. Um, because we had a block in the back here, and now instead of having the ball at the 43-yard line, it, it's back inside the 10. And I think there's I think there's under five minutes to go at this point. And then we drop the ball on the ground. And I mean, things are like, oh man, what's going on? It's kind of grew from there. And I remember hitting uh, DeFran on a sideline route, route through it perfectly. DeFran ran it great. And then we're like, okay, we're, we're in better. We're good. And then Burke ripped off a, like an eight yard run. And I'm like, okay, man, let's just get churn out first downs. And we got this game and then all hell broke loose. Yep. So we are at 27, 24 cases up and you can see Rob's back in the game, left ankles heavily taped. I'd imagine he's got a pretty good ankle brace going on there as well. And I think this is the pass to DeFran. Yep. So able to hit that. And yeah, at this point you hear about teams running the four minute offense where they got to go out there and it's not necessarily, you know, the two minute offense where you're trying to score four minutes more about grinding it out, banging out some first downs and, and kind of milking the game away. And that's, that's really the sign of a good offense when, the offensive line's able to impose their will in the fourth quarter. Coach Slash, do you remember in the moment what you were you were thinking at this point and just overall feelings on how the game had progressed? Yeah, I, I was fully expecting that we were going to run the clock out and uh, the game with us having to line up in victory. Um, this drive obviously started out and sucked with the, 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 the botched snap, but – Rob hitting DeFran on the sideline route was huge. And then Burke runs, gets a, picks up a good run, and then this happens. And at this point, I think there's less than four minutes to go in the game. And I believe it was second and two. And if we pick up the first down, then we're, all, we're well on our way. So I, I was feeling pretty good with where we were. And, again, you, you got to you gotta take care of the ball. And sometimes these things happen. But – Fortunately, we were able to uh, to get it back in and make something happen in overtime. Yeah, so we have another another quick change here. Cam Brown, do you want to take us through kind of your mindset when you know the offense, for one reason or another, is gives the ball up, turnover. Um, you know, defense has got to go out there unexpectedly. What's what's the overall defensive approach to these quick changes like this? Whenever there's sudden change, just want to make sure we're we're still locked in. You can't get down on on whatever um you know just what happened you gotta lock in and, and get ready to make a big stop um because turnovers are are a big part of um, momentum and so if we can stop them force them to get get a field goal you know have a bend don't break mentality then we can end up um you know kind of neutralizing the uh, negative effect that the the turnover would otherwise have and you know, like like has been said by by Vanity, we had a ton of confidence in in the offense. So we knew that if we could get a stop or if we could hold them to a field goal, then the, the offense would be able to go down the, and uh, get some points on the board. We'll see. They put the backup running back in here, and he's able to to slip through. And I say backup, but I mean he was he was extremely talented. We saw that in later years. So Carney's able to punch it in, and there is. Let's see, two minutes and 15 seconds left on the clock. So Mellon's able to score the touchdown. They'll convert the extra point. That makes it 31-27. So Coach Debs, initial thoughts and reactions when they punch that in, what are you telling your offense and, and what are you telling Rob specifically on what we need to do and go out and execute here? I don't know if there was a whole lot of talking. We've, you know, these guys were seniors. You know, Rob was a three-year starter. We had a lot of experienced kids. And, you know, we were good in the two minute situation. Um, you know, my concern was, and, and part of the reason that we had a, a run oriented game plan was Mellon really did have a nice D line. They, they rushed the passer very well. And now if we're in a situation where we're passing a lot, yeah, that was a concern. Um, you know, and Rob having a bad ankle, that kind of multiplied my concern. Um, because they're going to tee off and come after them. So, but you know, it's games on the line. We had our best players out there, you know, just go let them play and make plays. And we, we had a lot of confidence in our two minute drill and, and going fast. Rob, do you have anything you want to add on there? Just overall thoughts coming out on the field, knowing that 
you know, if you guys get this done, it's going to be a game-winning drive? I mean, I was pretty nervous, mostly because of my ankle, and was usually able to get out of there and make a play, and I knew that probably wasn't going to be able to happen. So it was, yeah, I don't know. It was, it was, it was a scary situation because you know that happened last year, and I did not want it to happen again. So it was. Um, well, I was going out there with confidence, but also you know a lot of things. Yeah, and I, I think the overall sense was you know up until Mellon actually put the ball in the end zone, you know we pretty much felt invincible, and then they're able to go up and. I can say personally, still at this point, I I had no doubt that we were going to be able to churn out some first downs here and, and get the ball down the field and and find a way to score. So we're we're down four at this point. Field goal is not going to get it done. Got to find a touchdown. And, you know, I've at this point 60 yards to go. And like I said, I, I didn't have any doubt. And, you know, play like that right there, you see Zerd maybe had a step or two. And I was just waiting for a big play like that to happen because we had done it throughout the year and hadn't necessarily had a close game. Um, but – just because we, this, you know, 2017 team hadn't had a close game that they had to fight through doesn't mean that these guys hadn't been through it in the past. You guys were all extremely experienced, uh, super deep team across the board. And I don't think people necessarily felt like the moment was too big pressure wise. We'll see that, you know, execution maybe wasn't the best on this drive for one reason or another, and it, it doesn't work out. But I think at least mentality wise, there wasn't, wasn't a whole lot of worry going into it. This, this was a big play here to get the first down to DeFran. Again, just another sideline route. Rob threw it great, and DeFran ran it well, and now we're in their field position, and now we're, you know, we're in pretty good shape. Coach Slash, how, how limited does the playbook come in this type of situation? Are there, are there four or five plays that you guys have practiced throughout the week that you're going to go to here? I mean, we practice – Every week against the defense, we have a period where we go in this type of a situation. And we leave a lot to the quarterback, depending on how much time is left and giving him some freedom to call. But with a dead ball, we can go ahead and, and send something in that we want to run. And that sideline route, for instance, we had had a lot of success with it, you know, from our own end zone the last series. And DeFran ran it well and Rob threw it well. So, now, certainly, we've got our, our entire playbook to, to run, but we do we do let our, our, our guys, our quarterbacks, make some decisions regarding what they want to throw in these situations. Go up, it's Jacob run a wheel route to the boundary. Um, and I, I'm not sure if we could have gotten this off um, because of the blitz and Rob wouldn't be able to avoid it, but that put us in a bad situation. Um, and now it's third and 22. And now things are like, oh, man, we, we got some problems here. Third down lot. Looks like we're going deep to Zerd. Uh, Rob, what goes through your mind when you kind of let it go and you know it's a third down and uh, the and, guy uh, doesn't catch guy it? Doesn't catch it. <laughs> What's through your thought process? I don't know. It was pretty tough in a situation like this because they're playing 20 yards back and just waiting for it. They knew we had to go deep, and um, I don't know. It was there wasn't a lot of opportunity, and it was it was tough. Yeah, I actually this was the fourth down play, if I remember correctly, where they uh, we kind of fumbled it, and then it was almost like the end of the game. And this is the one time in my three years of playing with all you guys. Uh, I remember coming off the sidelines and seeing, you know, Gage, Pig, Demo, Rob, even Burke. You guys, I mean, it was almost like this is it. This is the end. And obviously things did happen differently, but we had no other way. Um, how did you guys feel after this? I mean, what is it like my season, my career, my, my time playing football is over? Or were you kind of holding on to any hope at all to, that yeah. there might be a comeback? Yeah, coach, if you want to pause it here for a sec, I think um, initially for me, I'll keep it quick. I know I'm usually one of the ones who believes till the very end, but I think this moment I was getting, uh, I started to have those thoughts going through my mind, just like, this is it. And um, so that was kind of, um, it was really frustrating because you're like, well, what I really can't do anything. They're in victory formation. So yeah, that was a really tough spot to be in thinking, well, they're about to run up the clock and it's about to be over. Yeah, I think the, the timing was 
we were on the sideline trying to figure it out. We thought they would have to run one more play um, because it just wasn't timing up right. And it was just a matter of like five or six seconds, but they couldn't just kneel on it. And then, Bedell, do you want to, do you want to tell them what happened here? Because this is the play. This is the play that gave us a chance. Yeah, I heard uh, the head coach of uh, Carnegie Mellon. You, you don't see it right now, but before he had told the quarterback, when you get the snap, uh, take a few extra seconds before you take a kneel down. Because I think, like you said, they knew that they had to get punt the ball eventually or run one more play. And I think he was trying to eliminate that. So I figured this is my one chance to go make a play, go get the ball back for our offense. So my mentality in this play was, let's go. Let me try and get the ball out force a turnover somehow Um, because I know on victory formation there aren't really any blocking schemes because it's such a quick play so I figured no one would really block me from the edge Um, and I was going after the ball but it just worked out where I didn't get the ball out but someone had pushed me there he just went down before before I got there and then that kind of just ensued the uh, kind of the craziness because I I didn't think I did anything wrong because the quarterback was still up and and uh, no, you know, he, he was still was, a live target. Yeah, he was still up. There's no doubt. Yeah. Um, you didn't. And the kid that eventually got the penalty, he had no idea what happened. He just saw you go after the quarterback. He, he I'm sure he probably felt that the quarterback knelt. Yeah, he definitely did. He thought I had cheap shot him somehow. Um, and yeah, he definitely just was about to, uh, you know, he thought I just hit his quarterback for no reason. But uh, in reality, yeah, he was still up in the air, so I figured I can go get him and try and make a play. Um, so, yeah. Coach Miller, do you remember what you, our conversation on the sideline when all of that happened? I I do. Um, we were standing next <laughs> to each other kind of just saying, you know, I, I, it's too bad. I, I, we just – I think we made one too many mistakes to, to, to win a football game like this. And then the kid made the penalty, and you said to me, speaking of mistakes <laughs> – <laughs> and ran down and we called, ended up calling a timeout at one point. Well, yes. But do you remember what you said to me right after that in your way? When, I, they were, when the referee was like explaining what was going on? I, I don't. <laughs> Here's what you said. You goes, don't call a timeout. <laughs> no, I know. I know. <laughs> the clock wasn't going to run. Like, don't waste the timeout. I'm like, I know. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks for checking on me, Warren. <laughs> always, always. <laughs> so now, I guess just to, to recap that real quick, we were dead in the water. Carnegie Mellon was going to be able to run the clock out. We did not have enough timeouts to, to stop them. And like we've touched on, it was either going to be one play at the end or just another kneel down. They needed to burn a couple seconds. And by getting that personal foul penalty based on, on Luke's ingenuity, that stopped the clock, gave us basically another timeout. And, now they're going to have to punt. So there's about 24 or 25 seconds left. Carnegie Mellon is up four points. Okay, so we we have no timeouts left. We're going to get the ball with 15, 16 seconds left, best-case scenario. Our quarterback's hobbled. We just had a, you know, a fourth-down play or drive that stalled. And this is when Coach Debs finally, you know, turned around and looked at everybody and, and said, we're going to go get it. And, you know, different phrasing or however he said it, but – this was the pump block. This is everybody's coming. We got nine guys up on the line and this is, this is a fun group. It's a lot of defensive starters out there. A lot of our biggest, baddest dudes and and emotional leaders. And I guess Zach Lyon going into this play, did you have any, any confidence that we were going to be able to get this done or, you know, how did you feel just before, before this pump block happens? I just remember getting a big, adrenaline rush because I thought the game was over I mean they were kneeling we were dead in the water um I was kind of in denial I was like how did this happen and all of a sudden we're back in it we got a chance I mean it's a really crappy chance but we got a chance at least uh I just remember being really excited and also I knew we had this block up our sleeves we we practiced this all week so I I knew we had a, a at least a chance so I was excited and coach, if you want to let this run and maybe play it back two or three times from from both angles, just so people can see what what actually happened, and you know, I don't know if it's hyper hyperbole to say that this is maybe the biggest play in program history here. Yeah, we can see it better from the back. 
um, as far as the scheme. When I was on the field, I thought I thought Cody got this. And then I've never I, – I haven't seen too many times when a block kick ricochets back 30 yards. That was the crazy part of this, and it just fell in line with what the game was. It was just so unusual. And I remember the sound. I remember the sound of Lion blocking it. <laughs> I had a welt on my arm. <laughs> I remember, too. I didn't yeah. see it, but I heard it. <laughs> yeah, and it's, it's a little unfortunate that you can only see a piece of the sideline, but the sideline – explodes and everybody realizes kind of what's happening and there's a lot to a lot to unpack here so maybe we'll go to Justin Justin thoughts on this play what your responsibility was going into it and and what's your your thoughts were when you see that ball rolling 30 yards behind the line of scrimmage real quick Justin just I enjoy Habib's uh somersault or whatever the heck that is uh you know, Joe Blade got him things. on the tackle the sniper that's sniped yeah <laughs> yeah Habib showing off that athleticism right there <laughs> Um, I mean, I thought I was going to be the one to go get it. Um, no offense to anyone else on that line, but I figured I would be the one to go get there first. Um, and then they sent out, I think 44 or something like that out on me. So I thought he was going to get it off. And I heard, I heard, I remember hearing the, the sound of line blocking it. It's like very distinct and turn around. The ball was rolling to the end zone. All I could, all I was thinking was don't kick it into the back, Just pick it up and swear. So it's crazy. the scheme and now they don't run this punt formation anymore, so we can talk about it, was uh, – can you guys see the arrow? Yeah. Yes. So we were going to overload the side to, to his foot. Um, they had a tendency – they were a great directional punting team, and they had a tendency to kick right um, if they had a chance. Usually, they if they were on a hash, they would kick into the boundary, but it was in the middle of the field. He liked kicking right. So we set the overload to the right. And what that was going to do was it was going to bring all of their wedge people to the right. And number 42 had to block the A gap. And that's where I believe line, that's where you came through. Correct. Yep. And then Cody was single blocked by the center and that's a difficult block. So those were the two guys we thought would have the best chance of blocking it. Everyone else was just sort of exploding off the line in case somebody made a mistake for Mellon. And if they didn't, we were just trying to push them back into the kicker. But it, it worked as we thought. Both line and Cody came through. I really thought Cody was going to get it. And because of the directional kick, Lion's hand was right there. Yeah, I really thought I was going to block it when I got through there. And then I didn't feel anything. And I was like, dang, like this sucks. But then I heard it hit line. I was like, Oh wait, okay. <laughs> I actually didn't feel anything either. I just heard it too. I don't know why I didn't feel it, but I thought somebody else blocked it. Yeah. So a, a couple of things that we can fill in here. One, that pump block and that play is on YouTube in several places. You can hear it with the sound. There's a couple of videos of it and it's, it's very distinct. It sounds like a, almost like gunshot going off when it hits Zach's forearm. The other thing, for people that did not see Zach that day, we are not kidding when we say that he had a welt, he had a football welt on his forearm. And you could see it. I, th I remember looking at it 20 minutes after when we were walking from the field to the locker room. So it was very clear that, that he got it. And yeah, it's, that's the most amazing football play I've ever seen with all, all the factors in all the time, you know, all the time considerations, the score, the the stakes, that, that single play is is the craziest thing I've ever seen or been a part of. So I guess just to, to clean up some of the housekeeping, that pump block happens with about 20 seconds left. That puts us up. We converted the extra point. It's now 34-31. Case Western is leading, again, with 20 seconds left. And Coach Lally, do you remember what the call was or what we were supposed to do on this kickoff? And then we can kind of get into what actually happened on this. Yeah, so uh, we, were, we were headed down from the box and um, – then Luke made his play and going back in. So we, we watched what happened up in the box, all the guys in the box. And I look at coach Burke and I go, we, we probably need to plug the headsets back in because we're going to block this kick. So we end up blocking the kick. Um, and after all, all said and done, um, 
we're trying to get everybody back on the headsets. Everyone's scrambling to put everything on. And um, so I'm like, Coach Dibbs, you want to squib kick it? And everybody's on the field after we block it, and we got a 15-yard penalty. And uh, basically, I was like, their return game's dangerous, and we both agree, let's squib it. So Coach Miller goes over to the kickers, and he's like, do you understand what we want from you? We want to kick it as hard as we can on the ground, and it didn't work out that way. So... Yeah, and, and we can we can we can roll it here, but I don't know if it was a miss hit or a miscommunication. But this thing, so normally on kickoff, me and the other guys, I at least I would put my head down for the first five or ten yards and try and get ahead of steam going. And on, on this occasion, you put your head down, you look up, and the ball is five feet in front of you. And I know it was super confusing and panic time right there, but luckily we we're able to get them on the ground and wasn't exactly a fun si sideline to head back to. Um, people weren't super thrilled with that result. I, I swear it was a miss hit. We'll, we'll give him the benefit of the doubt, but so now I Mellon think, I think it, I think it was just from watching him kick it a number of times. I just think he did it. He just executed poorly. He was devastated by, it. I was so proud of him the next week because under like the worst conditions ever to be a kicker and punter, he made every extra point. He had a great game punting the ball. I mean, we, one of the big reasons we, we beat Illinois Wesleyan is because their punter dropped the ball twice and he handled everything flawlessly. And I thought he had a great comeback, but for that, for the next 10 minutes, he was, he was devastated. And even after the game, he was, I played with his father at John Carroll and we were talking and, you know, and he came over and I'm trying to calm him down. And he said, no, just every, I'm just so glad we won because everyone would have hated me. And he just, like ran away. I looked at his dad and we both kind of, eh, okay, let's try and get him back. So yeah, it, it worked out. And like you said, he was able to come back and make some big kicks for us the rest of the season. So yeah, no doubt. 20 seconds left. Carnegie Mellon's got the ball and we are up by three points so we can get back. It's, it's just a complete scramble. We got to get back into defensive mode and Banathy obviously didn't take a playoff, which is, is good to see. And in the back of our minds, we know they they probably had one of the best kickers in the country. Uh, their place kicker was excellent. He, you know, he made some pretty big field goals throughout the game, and then we're going to see him. He's able to come up clutch here at the end of the game. So it's tough. It's a scramble. And we had gone from thinking our season was over to guaranteed win, and now we got to get out and play defense. And you see their their offense, for whatever reason, was able to to stay pretty calm, and and they're able to execute in in you know the highest of pressure situations. So. They started with 22 seconds. It's it's getting down to, to under 15 here. And that play would have been a big problem if they were able to complete that because that would have brought the end zone into into play. They could have taken maybe another shot at the end zone and, and gone for the win. But Well, Coach Coach Miller and I talked, and Coach Miller, you remember what you said to me? I, I, I remember you saying, hey, let's just keep them out of the end zone. And I, Yeah, yeah the, the end zone was, was always in play for me. Yep. <laughs> and all they quite they they gained 10 yards on this drive to put him in position but he would have made this from where they would have gotten the ball originally this was good from 55 they had a great kicker they kick off and i think everyone is trying to catch their breath here it's definitely not the easiest circumstances but tie game 34 34 and and we're going to go to overtime and coach slush do you want to walk us through the overtime rules um who gets the ball and and just kind of the mechanics of that Yeah, I mean, each team gets the ball, you get on 25, and you get a chance to go ahead and score. And if you do, if you get a field goal, then the other team's got an opportunity to go ahead and try to match or, or, or win. And, I mean, this is, this is pressure, and we know where we are. We're, we're competing now for a, an opportunity to, to go to the playoffs. And we, we have a huge conversion coming up here. And again, it's guys being clutch, making plays. You got Rob on a on a on a bum wheel. You got Fan making plays. We go back to the to the back wheel that we tried earlier, and ah. just Smith. There's there's an equal <laughs> opportunity for each team. Yeah, and, and this uh, is what we talked about earlier. This is on that big sack. This is what Jacob should have done. 
he did it because we never go out on our boot protection. We hadn't gone out one time. So the back or the linebacker that had him man, he saw the boot protection said, well, he doesn't go out. So I'm just rushing and no one guards him. And we just missed it. Oh, it was there. It was absolutely there. I'm not going to lie to you. I was pretty worried when we didn't connect with that. I, I thought karma was just things were against us. Coach Debs, at any point does it cross your mind that you're playing for a field goal here when you have third and long in overtime? No, no, zero percent. I felt we had touchdowns to win. So on fourth down, we called a timeout, and it's fourth and 12. And I, I remember, Fan, do you, I don't know if you were in the conversation. I don't know if I, I think Rob was, you know, I was talking to Rob, but we I, I knew what I wanted to run. I wanted to run a bench route. Um, you know, you guys had that timed up and you ran it great. And, but a bench route is 12 yards back to 10. So that wouldn't have worked. So our comeback route was 15 yards coming back to 13. Um, so, but we hadn't timed that really. Um, so Rob did a great job of just taking one more hitch, you know, to give Justin more time and throwing it. And it was perfect. The ball was perfect. Justin created separation. I mean, this was a huge play. And I don't think, I don't think once during the year, Rob, do you remember running a comeback? No, no, I don't think so. It was always benches. And I mean, we ran yeah. in practice, yeah. we do it in one-on-ones. Um, but I remember releasing the ball and thinking there's no way he's going to catch this. <laughs> I just maybe I just wasn't used to the time because I thought I threw it too low or too out, but I guess he had more time to get to it because of the extra five yards. Or, but. Justin, do you remember anything about that? No, I mean I think it was just comes down to the chemistry. Um, I think I told Rob, you know, just throw it my way, no matter what. Here, oh, he was throwing it. it your way. There yeah. was no doubt about that. You were that was the call. I remember uh, when I caught it, I slammed my thumb on the ground and I. It was going numb, so I was afraid that for the rest of the, the overtime period, I wouldn't be able to catch anything. But, you know, that play was just focused on getting the job done right there. I mean, there's everything on the line right there. And then yes. Jacob rips off a long run, and this, this unfortunately took him out of the playoff game and high ankle sprain. Was, and that, then, it? was, that, the, was that the play that he got hurt? Yeah. And then it's third and one, and usually, guys, I – on third and one, I just want to get the first down. But Coach Burke talked me into throwing it. He goes, excuse me, it's second and one. So I'm like, let's just get the first down and then let's score. And Coach Burke said, you know, why don't we throw it? You can go for it on third and fourth down. I'm like, okay. And we called a, a sluggo, a slant go, a double move. And fan worked his magic and Rob dropped it right in. Great play. Great catch, great throw. Medved has the worst touchdown celebration I've ever seen in the back of the end zone. <laughs> so so for that, he was doing the LeVar ball dance. And <laughs> I had no idea what he was doing. He was running at me like that. I was just like, okay, I don't know what this dude is doing. Let me just go back to the sideline. Hopefully we can take care of this on defense. But that's what he was going for. <laughs> But no, that, that's huge. If you think about going from fourth and 12 in overtime, being able to convert it to you, Justin, and then Rob making another big time throw and Justin being able to come down with it. So now we're up seven points. It's 41-34. Mellon has to get a touchdown. This is sudden death. Starting from the 25 here and, and defense is back to work. So Justin McMahon, do you want to walk us through kind of your thoughts on this possession and, and how you guys are feeling just seeing the offense score? Yeah, uh, once the offense scored, we were really confident uh, coming in here and just knowing we just needed a stop and we were going to win the game. Uh, so we came out here and we knew, um, yeah, they're going to give it everything they had. They're going to get it to their playmakers and try and make some plays. But we were really confident. And, um, yeah, we're just like only, you know, four more plays. Let's get a stop and we come out of here with a victory. And so after all the craziness that happened before, to be able to be in that spot and uh, – we we're pretty fired up and uh, ready to go and excited for that series. Yeah. Crossy, do you have anything to add? Anything you remember from the energy or the, the outlook of this drive? 
I just remember just being totally locked in. I know the rest of the defense was obviously like we had, we already had the lead right here. We just had to get a stop and you guys know the rest. We, we definitely did. We get to watch Cody jump up and down here. I, I don't see the pick, but Cody apparently thought he could have made this catch. He's going to jump up and down and throw a little tantrum. And This looked like one of our first blitzes of the game here. We didn't blitz much at all. We were running a lot of our base coverage, I think, for most of the game because we were confident in that. But um, getting that pressure, I think, helped right there. We were feeling aggressive with uh, – Coach Miller was feeling aggressive out there. <laughs> yeah, and it hit my hand. So anytime it hits my hand, I feel like I should pick it off and – yeah, those temper tantrums happen pretty frequently with me. Jim. Love it. Yeah. We'll call it passion. And then this – so this play, they're going to complete a pass on fourth down. It's fourth and six, maybe seven. They're going to complete a pass. Tackle's made. The ball ends up coming out. I'm still not really sure if the ground caused if it was coming out beforehand. But if he fumbles that, there's a clear recovery. Game would be over. The other part is the spot. The spot's a little, a little sketchy. They end up saying the spot's good. They also say the ground caused the fumble. So – Kind of another roller coaster moment. We go from thinking we win. Andrew Lease actually takes his helmet off, um, which could have been a flag technically, but we avoid that one. They say the spot's good, first down. So they have first and 10 from the 15. Coach Miller, do you remember? I know your relationship with refs is pretty famous, but do you remember getting an explanation about this? Because the person that, that calls the ball down is the referee who is standing on the 38 yard line. No one else called the ball down. The side yeah, I, I, bean bag down. The explanation was that the linesman on the other side had the spot um, on Carnegie Mellon's side was what he was, what they told us. The guy um, right here. That's not at like, the how do you know, how do you know where to spot the ball? because the official on our sideline ruled it as a fumble. Yeah. He's coming down in there and he said that the linesman on the opposite side had the spot. Yeah. And apparently looking at him coming in here, the spot is close. Yeah. Close is close was a nice way to put it. They had to get the 15 and apparently they got it and the ground caused the fumble. So got to reload again, thought the game was over. Got to come back and, and get back to executing. Boy, we, we make some great plays here, Coach Miller. I, I'm sorry, Andrew. I just I get so excited. Like, you know, here's here's Cam spilling zone slam um, right outside. And Channon, I mean, this this running back is awesome. And he's in open space and just makes a tremendous play here. Great, yeah, the, great job. The guys were just so locked in and so so focused. And I mean, we I don't know if we played eight better plays throughout the course of the game in a row than we did in these eight plays of overtime. Um, and again, just, just how locked in all 11 guys were in and, and this play here. This is everybody remembers Luke Fidel trying to slap the ball out of the guy's hand. Um, you know, this is a play that, that, that I'll probably remember for the, the rest of my coaching career. I mean, we, we were going to double number one in the red zone. So that means someone had to be left alone by themselves. And in this particular play, it was, it was Luke and he, he did an unbelievable job and stepped up and, um, you know, did his job and, and other than intercepting the ball, probably couldn't have done it much better than, than what he did. Should have been a pick. I definitely should have caught that one. Honestly, <laughs> should have ended the game right there. We will take it. No, it's it's a testament to Luke to your preparation and being able to jump in and not necessarily a started throughout the year or even at the start of this game, but even being able to come in and make a big play like that. And and he knew he was on his own over there, um, and and he stepped up and, and made a great play. Yep. So they got they got third down here. Yeah. Um, able to great chip it chip away. Yep. Great job because they they wham. Um, Andrew Lease and Ian earlier in the game just blew up a wham block. Um, so they went back to it and they, they got Lease with it and they got guys on our second level players and we just shed off the blocks and make the play. I mean, that, that was, a, that was an awesome job. I know it got four yards, but it's a pretty nice job of holding the four yards on that play. 
Yeah, it's a great job by the linebackers. Even though they, you know, the linemen got up to the second level and engaged them, they were able to, to rip off and look like Justin was, was able to get off and make the play. So they got fourth down, fourth and, and five, we'll call it. And, and this is the game. You know, defense has had a couple chances to, to step up and, you know, make a play that, that's going to seal the deal here. And then they're finally able to get one here on fourth down. Coach Miller, who do you, who do you think made the play? Uh, the combination of Andrew and uh, and Habib. Actually, that's Ian back in there again. Ian blows it up for sure and gets yeah, moving in the wrong direction. Definitely does a great job. Banathy sheds his block. No, it was, it was a great. It was Habib tough to make how we played defense that year. It was it was everybody? Yeah, Habib came from the other job. Side. Good call, good execution, great play. Obviously, there's I don't even know who you could give the tackle to on on that play. There's three, four guys, definitely eleven hats running to the ball, and you see we're able to to get the stop on fourth down in overtime, and and that's game over. And I I don't really know if we could ever tie it down to one word or one sentence to describe what what we went through on that day or what we watched at the end, but somehow, some way, we're able to to scrape together a, a win and ended up being. 41-34 for the final score in case Western won, and we moved to 10-0, and and that locked up a conference title, two conference titles with the UAA and the PAC, and then also a playoff berth. Um, and the, the weird thing is, and a, a side note, Washington and Jefferson was also undefeated in the same conference. Uh, scheduling rotation, I guess, gave them the true conference title. But I guess open to your guys' thoughts – especially defense and, you know, even guys on the offense. What what were you feeling in this moment? Maybe we'll start with uh, Andrew Banathy. How did, how did it feel to finally get that stop there at the end and, and seal the deal? All right. Uh, so, like, I feel like I almost blacked out, like, right when that tackle was made. It was like I just couldn't believe that it's finally over, and I can't believe that somehow we pulled out that win. But I knew we were going to win when we got that fourth down conversion on offense, and that's when I knew that we were going to win that game. Like, it – when, our, when we had the willingness to go out, go for it on fourth and long, and then get it, we were – our defense was like, listen, our offense is able to do that. The least we can do is get a stop in the red zone. And, you know, every single guy on that defense did it. And, like, I think you see me at the end there. I literally fall on my knees and I give Cam a big hug after because it just felt so good to just finally, you know, enjoy that win because we've been wanting that moment since the second we stepped on campus. Yeah, absolutely. Ian, I know you had touched on that you were maybe playing with a, a bum shoulder throughout this game and obviously a long game. You guys were out there a lot. And I guess what was your immediate reaction in that moment? Is a is it a sense of relief, accomplishment? How are you feeling? Yeah, it was just uh I mean it was a sense of relief. I was uh that's the uh shoulder I missed on. I couldn't grab on my arm. We was just complete adrenaline that we were playing with. My arm was uh basically it was it was a dead limb towards the end of the game. And uh, I, I couldn't, I couldn't get the full tackle, but I slowed him up enough, you know, for for the rest of our team to to make it, and we could we could push through. It was just a surreal moment, you know, just to 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 finish the season undefeated, you know, not taking a loss. It was uh, it was amazing. I don't know what to. Uh, they may even catch me jumping in this clip. I don't know <laughs> how long this goes, but you know, I don't I don't usually jump on the football field that often. So that that enough should show you. Maybe we'll we'll shift to the offense. Jacob Burke, what are you thinking? Obviously, you you suffered an injury there on the last offensive possession, but from the sideline, seeing the defense come through for for the team and get the job done, what's your immediate reaction to that? Yeah, I mean, it was unbelievable. You know how um, just the roller coaster that we went on from the offense not getting that fourth down, and we're all sitting on the bench. I think we were just telling each other like it's been a great ride, um, been a great four years to the block punt, to the fourth down conversion um, on offense, to ultimately the touchdown, the defensive stop. It, it, it was just a roller coaster of emotions, and it, it was definitely one of the most exciting moments of my life, and it, it's definitely something that I'll never forget. Yeah, I think everyone would agree with that. Coach Debs, do you have anything that, that you want to add, just a you know immediate reaction to, to seeing that again and, and thinking back to what you and your team felt in that moment? Yeah, I'm, I, the adrenaline's going now, to tell you the truth. Um, 
from that last possession from, from four minutes to go, it went from, oh man, what are we going to do? They scored. Okay. Now how are we going to score? Thinking we're going to lose. And I remember vividly thinking, what am I going to say to these guys? How am I, what am I going to say to them? Um, Cause I felt so bad that two years in a row, we lost our opportunity to compete at a national level. And then the block kick. And then I, I was one of those guys that was out on the field. I caught myself about the numbers and turned around and like everyone was on the field. And I'm like, oh, this is my fault. Um, you know, and then the, you know, the field to tie it. Um, you know, I, it was just elation and just so happy for our players who, you know, this group of seniors, when they came in, we were bad. Our culture was bad. We were a bad football team. And, and they changed that. So I was, I was really happy um, that kind of their senior year, it just all came full circle from being in, an, in a program that had lost its way to a program that was one of the best in the country. And, and, the, and the senior class, they were the ones that, that made that happen. Yeah, I think you guys did a, a good job sum of, summing that up. And I'll, I'll provide just some additional wrap up, some context on, on where we landed on the stats. Rob Kuda ended up throwing for 171 yards. Jacob Burke ran for 164 with a touchdown. Rob Kuda, quarterback, ran for 116 with a touchdown. Justin Fan, six receptions, 101 yards, two touchdowns, and one in overtime. We had a pick by Banathy, a pick by McMahon, and one lonely punt block by Zach Lyon. And I guess Justin Fan also gets credit for a touchdown there. So, you know, it's it's a crazy game. It's It's something that I know – nobody on that team or nobody on the coaching staff will ever forget. That's, that's the peak of my athletic career. And I, I still cannot believe that it happened that way. And I can't believe that we all got to, you know, be a part of something like that just to provide some additional context after this, this game case Western went on to, to qualify for the playoffs. We were lucky enough to be given a bid to go out to Illinois Wesleyan, take a nice little bus ride out there. We ended up defeating Illinois Wesleyan 28, nothing, in a first round, we'll call it upset. I don't think anyone in our locker room looked at it that way, but 28 nothing over a higher ranked team. And then next week we drove down to Alliance, Ohio and took on Mount Union. We unfortunately dropped that game 41-16, but you know, for what it's worth, it was a two possession game there, you know, at some point in the second half. So we gave them all the all that they could handle. And I think everyone looks looks back pretty fondly on those playoff memories. So that's our story. That is what I would call, I'm probably biased, the greatest game in Case Western Reserve University football history. Definitely maybe the the top play, top single play if you had to nail it down. And, you know, everyone on this call, everyone that we've heard heard from tonight was a part of that. And they played a role, you know, if you want to get dramatic, even from the first day they stepped on campus freshman year, it was all kind of building to that point for the seniors. And then the underclassmen that were able to contribute on that on that game were, were also able to keep that legacy going, you know, use that momentum and in, into later years. So. Steve Bocci, do you have anything you want to add? Anything else you want to wrap up here with the guys? No, it was nice seeing everyone. Hope everyone's still doing well. Uh, Andrew did a great job. And like you said, that was a great summer. I mean, I wish I could bottle up that feeling I had on that day when I saw that punt be blocked and fan return it. Because if we had that energy every day, life would be much better. I agree, Steve. Absolutely. So thank you to everyone for tuning in, parents, friends, alumni. Thank you for all the support that you gave us throughout that year, throughout all all the careers of these guys. And, you know, like we said, wish this could have been over over a real football game at, at a normal homecoming, but I feel like this is a nice consolation prize. So thanks for sticking with us tonight. We appreciate the time and, and go Spartans.